It's time for Windows Weekly. Paul Thrott's here. Richard Campbell's here. They're both home. For a brief moment, we're going to talk about Windows AI. The future build is coming up. A lot of AI information, a little bit of Xbox news, and some uh, brown liquor next on Windows Weekly. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Therod and Richard Campbell. Episode 876, recorded Wednesday, April 10th, 2024. Solder on. It is time for Windows Weekly. Yes, the moment you've all been waiting for, the chance to throw uh, old fruit and vegetables at Paul Therod. Therod.com. Richard Campbell. Oh, you've been in my comments section. <laughs> nice. Richard Campbell for Runners Radio. Both, <laughs> Hello. Both. I, was, I was thinking Paul's generally the tosser, not the tossy. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. But I think These when things you, get tossed in both directions. Yes, once, so. you, once you start tossing, yep. you know, all bets So it's are welcome off. to the food I'm often fight, called right? a tosser. That's, really That's one of the That's terms, tosser. actually. You're a tosser. I don't know. I really, if I really want to know. That's a Britishism, but I don't really know. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is. Yeah, it's not to. complimentary. I can I tell you that. So I think you're right. That's not a, that's not a nice thing to say. Hey, Tulsa. <laughs> so what's the what's the haps with the? Uh, you know what? I'm seeing a lot of positive press about uh, yep. about this uh, NPU thing, and Qualcomm's yep. next. And uh, The Verge said yesterday, Microsoft wants to beat Apple. Who cares what game. Microsoft or The Verge says? What I say <laughs> what is... What does Paul Surratt say? <laughs> what is Paul I, you know, No, I mean, oh, Microsoft said something, marketing, marketing, marketing about Windows? That's interesting. No, yeah, you no, know what's more interesting point. is someone who looks at it themselves and says, actually, this thing's pretty damn good. Mm -hmm. Is and, it? Is it? Are you excited? Yeah, it really... Yeah. So you took and, this thing out for a spin. Well, I took it in for a spin. I couldn't take it anywhere, but uh -huh. it was a, yeah, Qualcomm has started inviting the press to kind of see for themselves, like what these things like ahead of the release of actual hardware. So it's Qualcomm, you know, you don't get to hear about like which companies are doing what and when and that kind of stuff. So those announcements will come, but um, they have their own reference hardware and um, yeah, some interesting stuff came out of that. I mean, I just qualify it by saying, you know, there's always that little kind of gotcha that may or may not happen. We'll see. But, um, you know, it's one thing to be in a room with a bunch of these computers and be able to play with them and do whatever you want to do. But, I mean, obviously, you have to get an actual hardware from a uh, computer from Dell or Lenovo or HP or whatever and, and see what those are like in the real world. But what I saw that day was nothing but impressive, like really impressive. And so um, it seems to did be... Did it feel the, overbuilt, like they're really building a crazy high-end machine or... or you never know with reference hardware. Yep. Oh, so this no, is not well, from, uh, this is not like the latest Dell. This is a Qualcomm build. Yeah, these were Qualcomm reference. computers. They had, Depending on the machine, it had 16, 32, or 64 gigs of RAM. Uh, LP, DDR, 5X, right? So it's fast. You know, good SSDs. Um, they were just 1080p screens, nothing special there. Mm. Um, but yeah, running, you know, the, the X-Elite, processor which has the integrated cpu gpu and mpu um the, and, and then you, you uh, gotta call it an m1 competitor right i mean that's what you're describing that's what they're I aiming at it, isn't it it's yeah. an m3 competitor actually yeah. right i mean yeah. it's it's you know these things are not neck to neck but in every category i i think the way it works out is that um single core i think the m3 is a little ahead and multi-core the Qualcomm is ahead, you know, that kind of thing. But like I said, you know, it, this is going to come down to actual real world software running on real world PCs. And, and also, you know, what's the battery life like, right? You know, we don't know that, but yeah. the thing that's in the, the interesting framing bit for me is I've been using this MacBook Air lately and it is uh, super thin, very light for the size of the screen. It has no fans, makes no noise. It never heats up. It never gets overloaded. It never glitches or acts weird or does anything strange. And, um, you know, sitting in that room with these computers and playing, you know, playing some games and running some AI stuff. And, um, this is a good, actually, this is a pretty funny video. You might, that might be worth playing. Um, but there were some good demos and, um, mm -hmm. one of them was, uh, well, a, a lot of them speak to this question we've had, which is okay, but 
what are the apps like? What are the how are we going to use this thing in the real world? Like, how do we right. sell this on people? What's the elevator pitch or whatever? You know, um, one of the fun, the the better demos. Um, well, that's not really one of the demos. Um, was Audacity is using the MPU to do uh, real time song creation based on a text prompt, right? Um, okay. That sounds Sta horrible. Uh, stable diffusion, obviously. There was uh, video editing with uh, DaVinci Resolve, which is using the MPU across a variety of workloads. You know that type of stuff. Um, the these uh, the games you're seeing here in this video are emulated. These are X64 games. They're uh, desktop apps. They're from Epic, not from the Microsoft Store. Wow. So this is worst case running. scenario. Yeah, I mean, and it, it, this is see. Before I saw this, what I would have said to you, like, what are these chips targeting? I would have said mainstream Ultrabook. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I my, my I reaction think, to seeing games being played is like, what? why are we looking at games? Because that stretches the limits of, yeah. you know, what's possible. Right. So um, the, the other the other video, Leo, is, is actually kind of humorous only because I make a joke at the end of it that was just perfectly timed. But it, it, the, the other one is like a uh, is the music creation demo uh video it's only it's probably just 12 or 15 seconds long but might, if i don't know if we can Is play it on the, the same sound, article it's, or uh it's in yeah. the article yeah if you yeah, scroll yeah. down you'll okay. see it in the middle of the article okay still scrolling. Um, i just still want to scrolling. see like what do you pin go. the npu with right like i i love your shot your screenshot there where the npu is running like yeah just like getting cranked yeah, yeah yeah exactly that's what you want just, right tell right. me you're using this nine seconds here we got five minutes of here we go. Five seconds. It created every Nickelback song. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm unduly proud of that one. But anyway, um, uh, yeah, it, um, look, we, I, I would say since last October when they announced this uh, chipset, there has been a lot of rumors and leaked benchmark stuff. And, you know, it's all been very positive and, Nothing I saw did anything but verify that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, that's uh, like a, this is what yeah, yeah this is what Qualcomm promised last year at their event, and of course my reaction was the sensible you, one. We've is, yeah, you've lied to us before, before, you know. I, well, let's yeah. wait and see. But now we've waited and we're seeing the only. Yeah, thing it's like you've been punched in the face repeatedly, and the guy's standing there with his fist like this. He's like, "No, this time I'm not going to punch you." And you're like, "I, uh, I wish I could get it in this <laughs> you know? red, though." I say, "I tell you what, I forget the yeah. performance and all that. I want just want the red." I color know. of that that's beautiful that's amd's color though somebody better tell, tell Qualcomm. so one one interesting uh, thing that i noticed there and others noticed too I, I i shouldn't pretend this was like an original thought or anything but uh qualcomm wouldn't talk about this too too much but um there there are different versions of this chip in those computers i um some people were reporting it as two i think i saw three different versions mm -hmm. and they have different um, kind of model numbers and different, uh, they have the same core, sa the MPU is the same always. Um, sometimes they're, it's not clear like what, what the differences were, what the, but there is some sort of hierarchy or tiering of the, of the chipset. Uh, so, you know, the only thing they said, to, they look, they said, basically, look, we're not going to talk about this, but uh, the one thing we can promise you is that unlike certain companies, <laughs> we're not going to over skew it, you know, like in other words, we're not going to have a million processor versions like, uh, say, Intel does. You know? <laughs> um, so we'll see what that means. But I thought that was kind of interesting. So it, they're all Orion Core, right? That's the, the code name, O-R-Y-O-N. But they're different. Yeah. There's different. Uh, there are multiple SKUs. This is running. They're different configurations, yeah. Which is really interesting. That's a that's fast. Yeah, there was really high. The one was speed. higher than that, actually. And then there was a three point something. But but you know, the the other thing is and again, I'm not a hardware guy. I have to keep qualifying these things. Um companies can handle this multi-core, performant core, efficient core thing differently, right? right? So Intel, as they move into this kind of hybrid architecture with the core ultra chipsets in particular have three types of cores, right? There's performant cores, efficient cores, and high efficient core, or ultra, whatever the, name, the term is. And the idea is you can turn these things on or off as needed. And ideally, what you have is a computer sitting there doing nothing, and all the cores are off, but maybe one or two of the high efficiency cores are just sitting there doing background processes or something like that, and it's efficient, right? Um, Apple has two, uh, is that true? I think Apple has two kinds of cores, right? Yeah. 
And um, AMD, the one-off kind of chips that they did before they started moving everything over to this hybrid architecture, um, the way their cores worked for this was the, like in the uh, HP Dragonfly row, I think is the name of it. Um, whatever number of cores it had, you, they could turn them on, on and off arbitrarily, but also uh, vary the amount of power they receive. Uh, so that's another way to kind of handle performance, efficiency, et cetera. Um, so these uh, Qualcomm chipsets or this Qualcomm chipset has only one type of core. Yeah, uh, multiple I think you're, cores. you're really talking about how Intel compensates for the fact that their pipelines are too complicated. And, they, yeah. and they're just afraid to get away from that. So they've gone this multiple different strategies to try yeah, it's, it's, to reduce right. power uh, consumption. Where yeah. if we just were simpler in the first place, you know, what if right, there was right. one kind of core that was power efficient and performant? You know, yes. what a concept. Why can't the one core do it at all? Yeah, so that's yeah. why I think the AMD approach is kind of interesting because it's mimicking how at least our, our Qualcomm does things, so, you yeah. know, in the ARM space. I mean, so. I would argue that's a byproduct of ARM more than it's a byproduct of what Qualcomm did with it. Okay, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like I said, I'm not, not really a hardcore. It's just, I, I, and I don't... Would you like a 20-minute on, on on CPU architecture? Like, we can do that. I don't think you want it. Just I don't. I'm just. I, I. I'm just. I. I just. I bring it up only to, because I found it interesting, and I. I. And I. I don't want anyone to think I'm presenting myself as some yeah. kind of an expert. Like this system is better because it's not that. It's just different. I. It's interesting to me that it's different. Yeah. Um. And we'll it's, see. It's part like, of a. There's a keynote I do where I talk about the hardware problems and 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 in relation to Moore's law, and I show the logic diagram of a modern Intel. CPU beside the logic diagram of a modern ARM chip. I think it's like the A8 or something like that. And it's yep. just it, because they've continuously built on it and built on it and built on it. There's just so many different little subsystems all through the CPU that that right. they're afraid to move. Every time they try to move away from it, they've been hammered by it, right? Like their customers have always been angry with them for it. And well, so they, they are the hardware version of microsoft they yeah. can't get away from the backwards yeah. compat thing you know yeah they I, have they have the innovators dilemma by times a thousand right yeah there, there's uh, i know that when apple was designing the um the m series chips one of the modifications they made one and it was kind of in deference to the uh legacy code base right then mm -hmm. on the mac just like on windows it was intel based right at that time um, they did something to allow for a quick conversion of those different architectures specifically for emulated code, right? Which went a long way apparently to making those things more efficient to that kind of mm -hmm. thing. And, and is one of those things that just helped the Mac be very successful in that transition. Yeah. Right. You know, whereas, you know, uh, I don't know how they, again, not a hardware guy, but I look back at something like uh, windows RT, which was our initial attempt in the windows space to go to arm. And, uh, you know, we got it to compile and everything, yeah. you know, but what but you, it, the, it yeah. could not emulate, like emulating. The, the emulating advantage code. that Apple has is the walled garden. It's their hardware. It's their OS. It's their core apps. They're used to beating their developers to death anyway. So, that you know, they don't, it's like, yeah, hey, we I, changed chips that you need to fix your apps or you don't get to ship. Like, that's how it is. I, there um, is a, I, the, we, it's not worth debating, but... Mm -hmm. The different approaches of Microsoft and Apple when it comes to backward compatibility, the more aggressive way that Apple um, uh, obsoletes Fails. technology yeah. and moves forward, right, yeah. has its advantages. Yes. It has its disadvantages. I mean, I think, mm -hmm. you know, in the Windows space, one of the reasons why, or in the PC space, you know, one of the reasons why Windows is such a big deal for enterprises, I think, and they want that stability and they want that, they want to know that. You don't have to think about it. Everything's going to yeah. work always. You know, they know they want that. a ten-year machine that doesn't need to have anything changed, and it'll work for ten years. Yep. Uh, and, and Microsoft is, you know, they no. deliver that. And yeah. I, I always felt like maybe there was a happy medium that could be found, but I well, the world I, I was argue moving. like, what's the argument for these Qualcomm machines? It's not necessarily Windows so much as it's less expensive Mac-like computers. Apple never yeah. tries to go for the low margin devices. That's not their business, right? They're the mar they they're the luxury product and they price accordingly. I I, I don't I want to be careful. I I'm not I don't mean to I'm not throwing a like a a PC company out under or a bus or anything. Mm -hmm. I don't mean it like this, but it is it, just a weird coincidence that the other night I, I told the story to Brad this morning, but I was I was I got a new computer to review and I'm I'm setting it up or we're, we're watching TV my wife and I in the dark there, and I'm just doing all the initial setup stuff, right? And so it has to install updates. It has to mm -hmm. install app updates. 
it reboots and it installs a firmware update. And as it's doing that, the machine, it's, this is the sound that it went on for 15 minutes. <laughs> you know, the, this, this, uh, sounds like a the fan noise machine. out of the thing. Yeah. Two seconds in, my wife looks up. She's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, yeah. I, I don't know. It's updating the firmware. I, I, so, you know, this is a, uh, as modern of a PC as you can get. It has a core ultra, yep. whatever, seven, one fifty five age, whatever it is processor. And I'm looking over at this MacBook Air, which has no fans, right? Yeah. And so is super efficient right and gets yeah. literally 24 hours. Well, literally probably 18 hours of battery life or whatever it is. But, and I'm thinking to myself, this, we can't get to that quick enough in the Windows mm -hmm. space. Like it's so important. And this is the thing, you know. And you got to know the that there's a safety mechanism in that machine that when it's changing the firmware that would normally vary the fan speed, default fans to max until oh. the firmware is back. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Right. That, otherwise you could damage the machine. But, well, I'm glad the machine's safe. Um, yeah. <laughs> I just... Uh, but it, it ruined better, you, you know, um, yeah. it, it ruined your viewing of Friends, but what are you going to do? Don't update firmware like while you're watching, watching, watching TV. Friends. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, Is this I, I was going to say everybody does, loves Raymond. Does this matter for <laughs> desktops? Are we still going to want to use Intel on the desktop and just Qualcomm wait right. for... Yeah. So the, the two mobile. things that are going... So it's funny because Richard asked a question that was, I think is related to this up front, which was like, What's the market these things target? And like I said, yeah. I, I, in the beginning, I, I before last week, I would have assumed it's solely ultra-thin, ultra-light, portable yeah. laptops, right? Yeah. Business class laptops, right? And there's no doubt that's a big part of the push. This is the mm -hmm. kind of, you know, the MacBook Air part, mainstream part of the market, right? It's it's where most PCs are sold. Um, but it's it seems like it's better than that. <laughs> so yeah. it could be- I think it, it is too. It has kind of a tiered experience, maybe. So it could, I'm not saying it's a gaming PC, but it's it's maybe more than you know. It's it, it's more than just that center part of the market. So that's I, interesting. I think that the race right now is who establishes the NPU standard. Yeah, this yeah. is the race, and and you have to do it with hardware. You have to. Yep. Oh, we're gonna we gotta talk about this a little bit. I, I want to get to the Intel and stuff it, in a and second because it, this plays the thing that, is like but, Apple should win this, except they miss the AI ride. So now let's see what happens. We're two months, what is it? Two, three months away from WWC. I'm really curious yeah. to see how, what they come out of the gate with because they are also going to follow Google and Microsoft yeah. with their respective developer shows. So this is the, the next, this is why I had this up front. The next few months are in a, just an inflection point almost in the industry. Yep. It's very, very this interesting. Is, this but, is when the MPU standard gets declared. What are we going to build against? Yep. But with regards to desktop computers or you know workstation class computers or gaming computers, that mm -hmm. kind of thing, I think that there are two things going on. One is that uh, ARM is scaling up, obviously, and we'll see how the companies that actually provide ARM chipsets adapt or don't adapt to the needs of that market, like dedicate, you know, like bigger, beefier GPUs in particular, uh, what it happens or not. Or um, on the Intel x86, whatever side, we'll see um, hybrid designs that kind of mimic the ARM architecture, or maybe one day adopt it, right? Or maybe. It's the it's that car truck thing that Steve Jobs talked about. I mean, at some point, th that part of the market becomes a smaller and smaller, still important, but uh, kind of subset of the market for those, I'm going to call them vertical use cases, right? Uh, gamers, uh, workstations, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I don't, I don't I mean, know. I mean, we'll see. We'll see what it I, I would also argue here that this is weird. If Microsoft wins this, it's almost unprecedented. I mean, Microsoft yeah. is used to building the API that makes all the stacks work together, right? The normal right. pattern for this should have been Apple wins it or Google wins it. The others emulate it. And then Microsoft comes in third with a with a, with, with a, an API that allows all of them to work together. If Microsoft comes in first here and somebody else has to make, you know, think ODBC, right? Microsoft did not have a winning database. And so... Right. They created an OTB, uh, they let well, they know, abstracted the connection. Who cares exactly. that the database is? Yeah, Ex precisely. And here's the issue, Paul. Yeah, it's not just that Microsoft can do that, it's that the rest of them largely can't. Like that whole approach to iterating on a standardized interface for developers, right? I mean, Google can, they'll just drop it three times along the way until nobody's willing to use it. And I Apple did. wants 30%. There, there's a there's something happening, and it's not a thing. It's a bunch of things, but yeah. a lot of it has to do with AP, uh, AI and MPUs and all this stuff. We we've talked about these uh, automatic upscalers that are coming, mm -hmm. uh, that are already here if we're very from various video card makers and are coming to Windows. You know, this notion that you can, I, I think to date, 
the, the argument was, look, you have to have the beefiest possible hardware to run this thing at the best possible quality and resolution and frame right. rate. And that's, you can't beat the physics of it, but you can sort of beat the physics of it by emulating it to the point where for most people, it doesn't matter. Yeah. And you enable higher quality seeming <laughs> games, if you will, to be run on lesser quality hardware, for yeah, lack of a better know. term. 8K and it, TVs aren't taking off for a reason. Most people can't see the difference. Yeah, so imagine right. if everything is upscaled to at least HD, you know, yep. a, a, and it's going to be good enough. Yep. And this, I, this uh, is the real destination of augmented reality. What if we just made your world shiny? <laughs> all well, the time? I mean, uh, the applications here are incredible. I mean, if you uh, to keep it to a very kind of niche -y kind of thing, you go back, you're like, I want to look at like an old video from like an Apple keynote from the 1990s, an old Microsoft event. And it's this 320 by 240, 15 yep. frames a second piece of garbage. And what if things like that could be upscaled? And that's that stuff's not really historically that important, but then you can apply it to things that are important and more meaningful or to TV shows that were not filmed in HD during that horrible era between film and HD where they everything was made on videotape and it was low quality. Yeah. Um, there's a whole, and that's just video, right? I mean, but there's a whole world of content out there that can benefit from this stuff and um, things get a new lease on life. You know, I talk about playing old video games all the time, like hey, the original Halo. Yeah, and the question um, is, is that game still good or, um, if, it's, Half -Life. if it's in high def? Yeah, well, uh, I can tell you that Half Life is <laughs> the first one is absolutely. I mean, not all, you know, not not all of them for sure. All right, so I, again, we could get, we could spend the two hours just on this topic. It, it, for sure, it's so much going on. But I, I, the, generally speaking, I just want to say the next three months, a lot of stuff going on. Yeah, PCs will start appearing by mid year. We've got the back to school and the uh, holiday shopping seasons coming. We've got computer shows, Computex and uh, IFA in the fall where, you know, new computers will be announced. Microsoft is uh, supposed to be announcing something at build or before build with regards to uh, Qualcomm-based Surface computers. Um, Intel last night, this, I was not I don't expecting know how this. we not buy one of these. I mean, it really, like. How, one of what? How do we not buy one of these new X-based Elite, X Elite machines? Like, I don't see a version of this year where I don't. Yeah. I, I, I just, I, I just got a new machine and I'm going to need it. Yep. Oh no. I, oh, I, well, I, you know what? I think you're in a good place because yeah. for the types of things you do and the type of machine you use as a surface book follow-up, I think you had a yep. surface book too before, right? It, it, that it's right there. I, I, I think you're good. I think you're fine. I, I, the, the question is going to be that was, so this is, this is what came up last night in the Intel thing. So, Everyone, well, not everyone, um, hopefully some people know that we right now are measuring AI performance, AI accelerated performance using a measure called TOPS, which everyone pretty much agrees is horrible mm -hmm. and needs to disappear as quickly as possible. But for now, this is what we have. It's, um, what is it, trillions of instructions or operations per per second, right? That's right. what it measures. Um, the Qualcomm X Elite has uh, incredible TOPS performance, right? The Intel Core Ultra Meteor Lake that came out that they announced and released the first uh, PCs for in last December does not. <laughs> okay, like yeah. it's uh, it is a uh, what is the difference? The uh, the Snapdragon X Elite is forty five tops just with the MPU. The MPU in the Intel is fifteen. Right. Or no, sorry, it's eleven. Mm. <laughs> it's like it's nothing. So. Intel had an event last night. So, of course, Qualcomm's going to be jumping all over these guys. And right now, the current generation AMD chipsets are also 15, 16. You know, they're not very high. So, right now, it's not even out. So, it's not even fair to say right now. Right now, there's nothing. But soon, we'll have these X Elite chips, 45 tops. Right. Um, Intel had an event last night and the, yesterday, and they talked about a bunch of different things AI related across chipsets, the cloud, the data center, et cetera, et cetera. But they did like a 10 second, well, it was probably a two minute thing about the the client, uh, you know, PC side. And they talked briefly about the next generation coming out that later this year. And then the, they mentioned the one coming after that. But the, the version of the, the, we'll call it the second gen Core Ultra chipset, the Arrow Lake chipset, will deliver. What's the number? I gotta I want to make sure I get the number right. Uh da, 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 da. yeah, 40 it will be 45. It will it will match right. uh, what what Qualcomm is doing today. Although 
by that point, they could be heading toward Gen yeah, 2. Yeah, a, AKA, we're, admit, we're committing to being behind. <laughs> well, that's the thing. Uh, the, the, their, the way they marketed it, marketed it, it <laughs> I found kind of disingenuous. Uh, they were mm -hmm. talking, they were acting like they were leading and these guys are behind and we'll see, you know, that kind of thing. But they also added like this interesting nuance, which I actually think makes some sense, which is that when you think about like AI accelerated performance, it's not just the MPU. In fact, most AI yeah. workloads today are accelerated by the GPU, right? Right. So as it turns out, you could measure the top's performance of a CPU and a GPU, and you could also add those together on a, an SOC and say, and say, hey, the overall top's performance of this chip is some number. So what they're saying right. is that... Or the, this system rather than the chip. That this entire system has a, a, a top's performance. This is Arrow Lake of 100 tops, and that's across all those things. So... When you look at CPU and GPU, you take away the 45, there's 55 left. Most of that probably coming from the GPU, I would imagine, but I don't, they didn't say, so I don't really know. Um, and the Qualcomm chipset that's coming out, you know, next month or whatever, uh, has a total tops rating or performance number or whatever we say that of 75, right? Mm. Um, in uh, AMD, right, like I said, is 15, 16 on the MPU. They are also promising a 3X. Uh, boom or uh, boost by the end of the year with the next generation of uh, MPU and the next generation chipset. You know, we'll see. So everyone's playing this kind of game yeah, right and now. I, and I, I'll bet you Tops reminds me of TPCC from the database era, which everybody yeah. agreed was a terrible specification and nobody could agree on changing it. So it just yeah. stayed. And stayed I, and I feel stayed. like it's going to go the way of like the megahertz thing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like remember the megahertz myth? Um I, there's a lot that goes into what makes a computer something this complex perform mm -hmm. well or not. And it's going to differ. You know, it's like a, here's a benchmark number neat. And then you use it in real life and you're like, yeah, but it pauses every time I go to save a document in word. Right. So it doesn't matter what that score is. If it you, doesn't work, well. you're talking about hyper threading, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So again, Intel compensating for old style architecture. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, uh, Intel is Intel. I mean, they do have, uh, they, they have a presence. They have a, you know, they're there. I mean, they're, a, they're a force to be reckoned with and, you know, uh, software makers are going to want to address that market. They've already yeah. sold, actually they provided some kind of a number, uh, da, 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 about, uh, 5 million PCs with these chipsets so far, 40 million by the end of the year expected, if not more. And then they had already said by the end of next year, they expect to see 100 million core ultra based PCs in the market. Right. So, you know, they're, they're, they're shipping at a volume that Qualcomm has never achieved in the PC space. Right. I mean, so I'll bet you AMD when, once these NPU architectures are settled out and this is how you call it and so forth, yeah. I will expect AMD to come up with a driver modification that allows their video cards to run yeah. very well as MPUs more. And I would say AMD rather than NVIDIA, because NVIDIA is already leading. Why innovate? Just yeah. keep running. What, one of the one of the things that came out at this Qualcomm event was that in talking with and not, not me, but in them talking with the various software makers, right? The mm -hmm. Adobe's of the world, the Da Vinci guys, the Audacity guys, et cetera, they they look at the workloads that their products undertake and they they find that some things work better on the MPU and some things don't, you know, and so they they optimize different parts of them for different things. And so mm -hmm. there, there are going to be these combinations of hardware components and then particular software apps, but also used for particular things Right. that for some reason are going to work really, really good. Yeah, you, you, uh, you're on it. There's going to be a yeah. synergistic moment where this particular yep. software with this set of chips. Yep. Is, and that's, you know, it's going to be tops number look silly. We're going to get advice from people like me, sadly, uh, but the advice is going to be tip. If you use Adobe Photoshop, this is what you want. Yeah, this, <laughs> you know, or the, these sets of parts with this yep. set of drivers, yep. magic. Yep. Yeah. And and this reminds me again of Apple back in the day when you know the G3 was kind of a thing, and they would put the two computers remember next mm -hmm. to each other, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they'd be like, "Look, the uh, G3 is done with this automated photo ta Photoshop task, and uh, the Intel Pentium, whatever it was at the time, is not." And it's like, yeah, but you know. It's not that the the Pentium was like slower, really. It's just that the Adobe optimized it for that particular chipset, and it if, just if know. if the PC if desktop PCs were more popular, I, I would be more comfortable as happening. I'm just suspecting yeah. that the laptop it matters the most, and those because of the ultrabook movement means yep. mix and match is not going is going to happen at the factory, not at the customer. 
Oh yeah. I mean, God, well, I mean, right. Are we eventually going to have, um, you, like the user ability to tweak, uh, what do you call that? When you overclock, like overclocking, a yeah. An MPU overclocking an MPU. Yeah. Uh, I probably not right no. away. <laughs> I suspect you know? never. I, you know, yeah. No, I, it, I, I feel the same way. It's, well, it's, just because um, the, the vendors always hated overclocking. It creates a ton yeah. of problems. And, so and because these things are, you get a chance to start over, stopped, you right? don't allow it to happen. Yeah. 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 But I do but think, the, you know, the high integration of chips to get a lot of these benefits means it's going to be tough for us to innovate here. So as, at the, as the end user. <laughs> so um, I'm still curious how we're going to sell this to normal people, right? Because yeah. the normal path for a PC upgrade these days is you've been using this thing for several years. You finally figure out you got to get something new. It's just slowed down. It's terrible, whatever it is. Now, now you have choices, right? I think people legit would might go and look at a Mac. They might look at a Chromebook even depending on their needs. If you're really technical, you might even look at Linux, right? So you've got that problem when you're Microsoft or Windows. But if, you know, whatever, mainstream people they don't really think about it, care too much, the type of people that buy a car without knowing anything about the brands and just want right. a vehicle, they don't really care. Go to Best Buy, be like, whatever's the best thing, who cares? Even in that scenario, if you wait, whatever that number of years is, five, seven years, whatever, that PC is going to be a nice upgrade. You know, yeah, sure. it's always going to be a good upgrade. So And, and uh um, um, Rob bot was asking about, can we get laptops like that are modular, like desktops? Like that's the framework laptop. Like framework well, has a chance here to grab this X elite and to modularize it. Oh, that would be interesting. I would. Yeah. So, all right. Let, so we're, I, I, I'm there. Like I said, we could spend the whole two hours in a side. I'd say quickly to oh, this, that the, the one thing that has happened, <laughs> well, Framework, uh, not because of framework necessarily, but framework being sort of the uh, this tip of the spear on this movement, mm -hmm. there's this right to repair thing that's happened that has yeah. impacted the phone market a little bit and the PC market quite a bit. Um, PCs today, modern PCs, modern laptops are far more repairable, user repairable than they've been since, I don't know, late 1990s or early 2000s. Yeah, since before Meaning, the iPad, I would argue. Really? You can unscrew yeah. them. Really? You can take out the battery. You can take out the, you know, the, the RAM in some case. Sometimes RAM is soldered on. Is that uh, sold. Yeah. Is that true of uh, sometimes Lenovo sometimes. too? Because the ThinkPads are yeah. getting more and more glued yep. together. I'm so happy to hear mm -hmm. that. Oh no, no, no! These are no. This is by law. They have to do this. This oh, is they have this to is be, happening. Okay. Easy, oh yeah, easy they have stuff. to. Yeah. Awesome. So this is awesome. Yeah. So one of the one of, as a as a like reviewer of laptops, one of the big things I've noticed in the uh, messaging over the last several years changing is a real emphasis on sustainability, which includes you know recyclable uh, recyc recycled parts and recyclable components, right? But also this stuff, right? That you could open up almost any laptop today, new ones, and replace the uh, the SSD, which is an M2 slot. Replace the mm -hmm. wireless card, which is an M2 slot. Uh, replace the battery easily without killing yourself or breaking the computer. Um, not the CPU, obviously. Um, and sometimes not the RAM. Sometimes you'll have RAM that's just on the motherboard, but there's a uh, an expansion slot. Sometimes it's all expansion slots. Um, it depends on the on the model, but and this is the the ultrabook mantra was to minimize yeah. size, so everything was soldered on. Yep, yep. But I think this right to repair movement has had its effect, and so we may not get to the laptop, the framework everywhere. Yeah, but we we're, we're well, definitely one would argue closer to it, the right? real thing is to make smaller connectors, right? Yes, like, and like actually, so used to be big and bulky. <laughs> again, I I I didn't. I'm not trying to fly off on this complete, but that's happening too. So there's yeah. a next generation standard for RAM. If you think about an SO DIMM slot, um, yeah. whatever that size is on a laptop is basically half an M2, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and there are micro, there were smaller M2s as well, but um, they're they're getting just like uh, SIM cards, right? They're turning into these little nothings, right? And so mm -hmm. that that will help a lot, and will alleviate some of the concern. I one of the, the listen, as great as computers are today, one of the, and phones too. One of the things mm -hmm. I really miss is the ability to pop off the battery and pop on a new one, right? Well, the, big, yeah, or, the biggest one is replaceable. I, battery. I, Yep. You know, you yeah. travel, you travel a lot. It's like, look, I just want that extra battery, you know, yeah. um, that stuff's killer. So, well, uh, and batteries wear out when phones still function. So right, exactly. You just swap right, the battery. Exactly. Exactly. So we've made it easier for the company and for third party repair shops to repair these things. And now we're moving to a model where the user themselves, if they want to, mm -hmm. oftentimes can do it themselves. Yeah, I mean, well. And you did the whole piece on surface, making parts available. Yep. Like they, that, that's, that's part of it. Right. That's right. I have to say, though, the framework, I mean, you do it with a screwdriver and you can actually replace the motherboard. You can go from yeah. Intel yeah. to AMD, which yep. is pretty amazing. Only, uh, if they I, made that with a Qualcomm X Elite, oh, I know. Man, I, know. I would buy it so fast, mostly because I could put Linux on it. Mm.
That is the important part. You know, I, yeah. I feel like you're broken inside. I am. So, I am. <laughs> no, uh, no. Um, that's fine. It's, it's just the a Troy, good like recallable the, gag. Like the, you, this is the benefit of the PC <laughs> ecosystem. You can do what you want. That's the, the difference. Point, is, right? I'm serious. <laughs> uh, no, I know. No. It's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, that's well, fine. And, and actually, it remains to be seen whether uh, Linux on ARM will be as uh, right. good as Windows on ARM. You know what? It, I, it's, I think it's going to be. I think. I think so far, it's pretty good. You're already, ta so far you're already talking good. about a system that, yeah. by nature, is more lightweight than Windows to begin with. Right. My God, mm -hmm. if anything, it, it, this and it's be, always uh, had ARM support. I mean, it's not a new yeah. thing for for Linux. So, anyway, I, I mentioned earlier this kind of lack of an elevator pitch, and this is the problem. Uh, you know, someone walks into a Best Buy, let's say, and they okay, I want a new computer. That one looks pretty. Bring it home. Who cares? Um, it's, it's very simple. How would you Battery sell someone? life and no fan noise. That's I think that's the thing. I, I think the thing sell, that right? it, the thing we've always wanted in the PC space is something we can legitimately hold up against a MacBook Air and say yeah. it's this, but with Windows, that kind yeah. of thing, right? Right. Um, and so I think we're going to get that, um, and that's fun. But I, 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 I think I feel like we touched on this in the past. This notion that there is no such thing really as a killer app for AC for uh, AI for PCs, but rather a thousand little killer apps that are very vertical that are individualistic like something that might matter to me or some set of three or five workloads whatever they are may be different for you may be different for my wife may be different for grandma walking into best buy whatever it is right so it, i don't think we're going to get the the mainstream uh push of you know pc exciting new pcs uh, other than the fact that may, maybe a macbook air type thing super thin super light super quiet Maybe, maybe 18 hours of battery life. We'll see. That I can't promise, but. Would that's these also the dream. be, I mean, Apple also offers M3 Maxes on laptops, and that's what I have. And right. that's a power. Well, they serve the, they serve the range. It's the range. So, right. so Qualcomm Elite X could do that as well. Yeah. And that's sort of what I, I, I think I was. I mean, the, look at the Being games. hinted at by, you yeah. know, by seeing these things. I, I think they are, they're going to have a tiered, uh, I don't want to call it a family. I don't know how they're going to market it. But, um, you know, for example, I don't remember the dates exactly, but Qualcomm announced these chipsets in the uh, very late October. And then, I don't know, four days later, Apple announced the M3. It's like, really? Right. <laughs> you know? And, of course, Qualcomm had just compared everything they had to the M2, mm -hmm. right? So now there's an M3. And the, the inference there is, well, you're already a generation behind again. But... Part of the reason for this little thing I went to was like, actually, we've tested against the M3 and we're, we're we beat them in most areas, so uh, we're looking pretty good. That doesn't include M3 Pro or Max, right? Those are at a different level, and they target a different part of the market, right? That's a arguably like a portable yeah. workstation, whatever you want to yeah. call it. But um, you know, maybe they get there. I don't know. We'll see. But anyway, the, but the software is the big thing. So we, um, I hate this part of my job. I hate that I have to do this so much, but. For years and years and years, when we don't get the answers we expect on some milestone or some date, we always say, well, Microsoft has Ignite coming up. I guess we'll see what they do then. Or Microsoft has Bill mm -hmm. coming up. Mm -hmm. I guess we'll mm -hmm. see, you know. And so we we always have to do this because we really, you know, they're not super transparent about when things are going to happen. But no. uh, they just released the Build session list, right? So Build is coming in May. Can we hold off and, and talk about Bill in a moment? Yeah. Would you mind? Oh, I mean, it just ties into this. Yeah, yeah, I understand, I but it's a, okay. if we can, yeah, of course. Just, yep. we'll do a little ad, and then I do want to hear this. What is yeah. Microsoft okay. going to do at Build? Uh, it's going to be interesting. Are you guys going to be, you're both at Build, right? Well, yeah, this is the thing. So I contacted Microsoft today, like, are you going to send out press invitations? Um, what's going on? And so they're going to get back to me. Oh. <laughs> so okay. I, you know, I'd like to be there. I, I, I'm, I'm thinking about just going, even right. if I don't get in. Okay. <laughs> just because I think I need to be there. Sounds like so it's we'll going to be interesting. Anyway, hold on. I think this is a big one. Yeah. Hold that thought because mm -hmm. it is going to be interesting and we're going to talk about it. But first, I think a word from our, um, I said first, there we go. A word from our sponsor, Cashfly. The show brought to you by Cashfly. Quite literally, there are content delivery network, our CDN. We've been with them for, I think, more than 15 years now. They've been around for a while. For over 20 years, Cashfly has held the track record for high-performing, ultra-reliable content delivery, serving over 5,000 companies in over 80 countries. We've been using Cashfly practically since the beginning at Twit. In fact, I don't know if Twit would exist if it weren't for 
Matt Levine at Cashfly coming to me and saying, we can help. And man, have they helped. We love their lag-free video loading, their hyper-fast downloads, friction-free site interactions. We really love it that we don't hear about it. It's, it's transparent behind the scenes. You may not even know it, but I know you're getting our shows faster and easier anywhere in the world because of Cashfly. It's the only CDN built for throughput. Ultra-low latency video streaming on Cashfly means you can serve up to a million, actually even more than a million concurrent customers with latency under a second. If you, uh, if you have a game, they are a lightning-fast gaming solution delivering downloads faster, zero lag, glitches, or outages. If you've got a website or you serve images of some kind, mobile content optimization offers automatic and simple image optimization for any size screen, which means your site loads fastest on any size device. Flexible month-to-month -month billing. We were very happy to have that because, you know, we were just starting out and we didn't really know what our, what our demand, our peak bandwidth would be, but they've been great working with us. Flexible as long as we needed it. Fixed contracts for discounts when we were ready to do that. Design your contract when you switch to Cashfly. Cashfly delivers rich media content up to 158% faster than other major CDNs. It allows you to shield your site content in their cloud, which is incredible. It means you're going to get 100% cash hit ratio. We do that. We've been doing that for a long time. One of the earlier, uh, kind of, I guess we were in a beta program, but it's been fantastic. They call it SOS. Oh, and did I, forget, I forgot to mention their incredible service and support. With their elite managed packages, you get the VIP treatment. You get a dedicated account manager there from day one to help you make the transition and reliable 24-7 support whenever you need it. Learn how you can get your first month free at cashfly.com slash twit. That's, and you've heard me say it many times for 15 years, C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. Cashfly.com slash twit. Thank you, Cashfly. For your support of Windows Weekly, we appreciate it. Paul Thorat, Richard Campbell. Now, let's talk about Build, the big developers conference. And probably the first place we'll see Microsoft's, you know, yeah. explanation the, the, the of all of this, right? Well, they're not really rumors. I, they pretty much confirmed, you know, there's going to be some hybrid AI occurring in Copilot in Windows, where there'll be something happening locally, something happening in the cloud. They'll probably talk about that. Um, obviously, it's interesting just to see who's in the keynote, right? So Satya Nadella, duh. Kevin Scott, CTO, uh, yeah. Rajesh Shah, he's basically in charge of Microsoft 365, which Windows is included in. And then Mustafa Suleiman, the guy who runs the new the Microsoft new guy. AI. Yeah. Yeah, the new guy. What about the um, long-haired hippie guy? Uh, yeah, you mean, well, which one? You mean the good one, not the bad mean, one. Uh, <laughs> Batish, not the bad one. Um, <laughs> What was Sorry, his name? Stevie Batish. Stevie Batish, yeah. yes. Yeah, so he'll be, uh, he's not mentioned, but uh, that doesn't mean he's not, you know, going to come out. We'll, we'll, we'll see. Yeah. We'll see what happens. Well, you know what? That's an interesting question right there, right? Um, uh, part of this new AI organization is opens a can of worm of questions about other people, right? What's going on? But um, but Microsoft has, uh, anyway, like I, like I said earlier, I, I We'll see, let's see what happens to build. Let's see what happens to build. Let's see what happens to build. And then Bill comes in. It's like about the cloud and, you know, there's nothing, right? But they put out the session list and actually pretty pretty explicitly, there's some interesting stuff in there. Um, they're going to talk about this next generation of uh, Windows and ARM, right? Which they're basically treating as a new thing. And then there's this kind of uh, on opposite ends of the spectrum. This is the literal temporary name of a not to be recorded uh, session called Designing for a brand new Windows AI feature, whatever that might be called. Mm. Um, so that's kind of interesting. <laughs> so, you also have to wonder what sessions are they not listing because they're part of announcements. Yes. But the fact that um, they're listing some of these just says hey, there's a lot going on. Yep. There, there are a curious number, by which I mean more than zero, sessions about Win32 app development. And then with this disconnected set of technologies, WinUI and WPF, which is Windows Presentation Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, Windows Presentation Foundation dates back to, you know, Longhorn and- 2006. Uh, yeah. Long time ago, you know. Yeah. Um, it's stuck around. <laughs> People still use it, of course. Yeah. 
Um, it's experiencing a bit of a renaissance, although my understanding was that WPF and Windows Forms were both mostly community driven these days. Is that not the case? I thought no, it was. No, no, uh, there, there, there are supported editions that moved across to .NET Core. So they, they made okay. that jump. Uh, WPF is integrated in Maui. So you can build a Maui app. Okay. And we'll render oh, it up that's WPF as well. All right. Okay. Um, so yeah, there's, I mean, they, it's, it's, there, there was that XAML reckoning, right. To try and bring yeah. all this stuff together. That is ultimately what Mao, I, Mao is about. Uh, we talked about Microsoft's embrace of backward compatibility earlier. Mm -hmm. It applies very much to the developer space. And there's always been this kind of notion that if you, uh, there are ex <laughs> definitely exceptions, but you adopt Microsoft technologies on the developer side, and they'll they'll take you along with them. They they drop things, you know. Silverlight yeah. dropped off, um, but you know, Silverlight is still considered a, a complete catastrophe for some folks, right? And I would I, and argue yeah. is the exception, like right? Generally, but, they're, I, but they're the, the answer, I a hundred percent. But I, you know, when you talk about something like WinRT, right, which is not .NET based, but mm -hmm. you can at least make this argument that well, it, you see Sharp. Use YAML. It's .NET like, yeah. you know. Was, your skills move as forward. As a .NET developer, you know? there was nothing to do for WinRT. You ran the version. You you ran the 20, 20, 2012 version, and it compiled yeah. to ARM. Right. It was just it, it, yeah. it would JIT to ARM. Now that was it. Right. Right. And it went away after twenty thirteen. Yeah. Yeah. But but again, there there is some path forward in the sense that languages, uh, you know, the the framework names and uh, namespaces may change, but mm -hmm. it will at least be familiar and that kind of thing. So, uh, WPF is this. I almost called it a cockroach, but it's this thing that has kind of persisted across this continuum as things have kind of come and gone. It, it's it's come out on the other end, and it's, it's still there. It's, it's come to mean out. different things along the way. I mean, yeah. Yep. You, know, you call it the cockroach, but at the same time, it's like, you mean the tool that Visual Studio is built on that one? Yeah, no, no, I, 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 I sorry, I didn't mean that anything other than lovingly. I, uh, of all the Microsoft frameworks over the years, for lack of a better term, mm -hmm. I, and for all the problems with XAML and not really ever being able to come up with a, a true visual editor for that, a visual basic style thing. Right. I still love WPF, right? It's, I mean, it's like, it's. But I still think they should have back. moved forward with something based on that and not gone to win RT. But you know, oh, whatever. you know, it's not like it's going away because it's now integrated into Maui, right? Like XAML's yeah. never going away. No, that's what's fascinating. That's what I mean. Yeah. They're talking about it at build. That's crazy. Yeah. It's 2024. No, no, you understand? This is 20 years later. Like they were talking about this at build 2020, uh, 2003 mm -hmm. when it was well, called Avalon, right? Called I mean, Avalon. this is. But the, you know, the, the original Avalon vision was never manifest. It got kicked out yeah. to become WPF while they tried to fix the crisis right. of delivering right. a new OS. And then it tried to be reintegrated back in, in eight and that went well, right. you know, it, it's never really manifest as it should have. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, it doesn't surprise me. They're still ringing around with it. There's some good people working on it. It is a, quite a capable technology. It just yeah. has had an incredibly rough ride. Yeah, but it's like I said, cockroach kicking around. I love it. It looks <laughs> going, you know. Yeah, it's it's beautiful. So we got all this stuff happening, right? We got Windows 11. We talked about this last week. 24 H2 staggered release, right? They just released. Well, we'll talk about Moment Five in a second, but this next thing will occupy probably the rest of the year. That will probably be most of the, as far as the system part of Windows. We've got Build, where we're going to learn about their plans for hardware accelerated AI, Copilot. Uh, new and updated AI experiences in Windows, et cetera. They're, I'm sure they're going to cart out there. I don't know anything about it, by the way. I'm not saying anything, but I, I'm guessing, but I'm, I'm educated guessing that they will bring out some third parties, right? Mm -hmm. um, That's uh, what I would do. I, I would want to have Dell on this ta stand, table, a, a Lenovo, like yep. show us your Well, uh, that's, I, that's, um, Heck, yes. Okay. Microsoft uh, we'll really I, wants yeah, to go know. all out. Every attendee will be walking out with a piece of hardware. Like uh, that would be amazing. Al Al um, RT, right? Yeah. Uh, I guess I didn't put it in my article, but uh, Qualcomm had an amazing slide of all the uh, software makers that were um, natively compiling and releasing on ARM and mm -hmm. targeting the MPU. And uh, it's, it's pretty broad and wide and, you you, you kind of is as stupid as it sounds. It's just an app, <laughs> you know. I don't but think you, you, you could. You know, you're saying the big pieces here, which is maybe AI is the thing that makes ARM on Windows come true. 
because yeah. it's only so compelling. But now that you have to do this other thing too, yep. now it's the combination. It's the perfect storm of timing and capability. Yeah. And it's, yep, it was not, yeah, back when they ever now, it's 2016 or 17, whatever year that was, um, we weren't there. You know, but, and, but and look, maybe again, someday I'm, I'm we'll, freaking out the idea that Microsoft might actually be in the best place to put all these yeah. ingredients together first, the right software with the right hardware. And it's the right like, we just experienced a, uh, a solar eclipse, but this is more like when the planets align, right? Yes. And you get some number this of them the and it, it's very unusual for these <laughs> things to all because they're not all in the same plane no, for one thing. No. So like it's very, so this alignment of things it's is, shocking. Uh, yeah, well, is, well, yes. We're anticipating it. There's plenty of ways for it to still go wrong, but we are. Oh, and I, let me just throw out the elephant in the room, the thing I've been bitching and moaning about for the past three years, which is Windows 11, right? That yeah. here they are ignoring and overtly insurtifying Windows by forcing Edge on you at every step of the way. Mm -hmm. Or you choose Edge and it still complains to you because you changed the default enough. search engine or had the <laughs> temerity to modify your new tab page or something, yeah. right? You're not um, enough for us. Yeah. I OneDrive and all the terrible behaviors there. Um, there's a, there, there are still problems, and I, I you know that doesn't go away. Uh, that is the asterisk, the little thing, the bug in the bottom of the drink that has me worried a little bit. But yeah. um, you know, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. But I, I would love a lot the, of stuff. I would love Bill to be this thing where they say Windows is going to get great again. Because this is what we said from the outside about this. That implies that it somehow it, wasn't great. Yeah. That, they, well, I don't know if you've been paying attention to the show for the past two or three years, Leo, but uh, I've had a crisis of confidence here. But we talked about this um, when the AI thing first came along with, with the first chat GBTs and so forth. So Windows is the logical hub for this interface. It's just we don't believe the Windows team can pull it off. Yep. Maybe this is the new group is it, and they're, they're going to roll up. Uh, they're yeah, going to come I, rolling I, in. I can't wait to learn more. I am. Yeah. I'm. I. I. Uh, you can only be cautiously optimistic, but I am optimistic. I feel. Mm -hmm. I feel. I feel like things are lining up pretty well. So we'll mm -hmm. see. You know, we'll see. Um, and and so, in a serendipitous way, there is no grand plan, as Scott Hanselman said so brilliantly. We are not yeah. organized enough to be as evil as you want us to. That's be. right. So. <laughs> that was always the big. Well, that was the big look. The big counter argument um, uh, during the Microsoft antitrust stuff was yeah. like, I, I don't think you understand how little the groups at Microsoft talk to each other or how little they like each other. Yeah. You know, like one of the, like this notion, like Microsoft used to talk about this apocryphal, you know, Chinese wall between the two parts of the company. And internally they were like, we don't need a, this, there's already a wall. We hate each yeah. other. They don't, we don't, you know, we don't talk to them. You mean that wall over you there? You want to talk about this wall? wall. We, we're in is different that, buildings. Is, that, is we, it like a conscious desire to make sure that everybody kind of is competitive with one another or is that uh, cultural? No. In, no, no, it's, it's a cultural thing. So yeah. it, it in, really in the, came up, in the gate scene and in, in Balmer era it was certainly. Well, but also just the, the, the culture of different parts of the company, like the, the, the part the part and then parts of the company that were making OSs, NT and Windows, right? And then the part that was parts that were making um, apps, mostly Office, but then the other stuff. The completely different cultures, completely different ways of looking of shipping products, completely different mm -hmm. abilities to make or not make schedules. To, you know, to realistically determine how long something is going to take, and then you know they, they were just different. And um, I, you know, this this. And by the way, there were there were rifts that you can point to from the outside that you could see. Um, the, mm -hmm. We used to talk, remember, you know, Windows wasn't done until Lotus doesn't run or whatever yeah, the yeah, phrase yeah. was. Yeah. Um, Windows was also 80s. not run until Office came up with a UI that Windows could then take and put <laughs> and give it to everyone else, right? Yeah. Like, but there was also this, there's also the reverse is true, which is like, what happens when Office doesn't adopt technologies that are windows right. it basically just kills them dead in the water and, right? and then now you're talking about wpf like my wpf yes. would be the center Explicitly. of ux yep. implementation if office had implemented if they just done it they, they were like nope not doing it but you yep. know the difference yep. was that you know gates was the one that told them you're going to use mdf you're going to use yep. ladb like he, he had yeah. the power to do that it was a different era yeah he yeah. had moved on bomber uh, didn't have that strength he couldn't make those hard those hard technical decisions. There, uh, we mentioned Windows RT. There was a 10 second period of time where they came out and said they were going to do this. Mm -hmm. the, the the primary version of Office going forward was going to be this mobile version of Office yeah. that ran across phone, desktop, and mm -hmm. maybe on the Xbox if you wanted it to. And 
the, the only thing that ever came out of that was that OneDrive for Windows 10 product, which was very good, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, and they, and, and you know, you would have Continuum. You could, you know, if you ran it on your phone, it looked like a phone app. But if you connected the phone to a screen, it looked like a Windows app. It was really, you know, it was a good idea. Yeah. But then the Office guys actually got a good look at like what they would have to do, and they were like, "Yeah, we're not doing this." Mm -hmm. And then even with, uh, even with OneNote, they eventually scaled back and said, "No, we're going back. We're, we're, we are literally dusting off the 2016 code base." putting this back app back in the product, bringing it up to speed with everything we did for what we now call OneNote for Windows 10. And then we're getting rid of that old thing that was going to be the future. And in doing that, uh, for very, you know, pragmatic reasons, right? Obviously, it's a huge code base, legacy code base. I mean, it's, you know, it was impossible to replicate this in some other uh, framework or whatever. Um, they also, that played a big role in killing WinRT, right? That, that was the, when off, Office said yes tried it and then said no in some ways that's even worse than just saying no because a lot of people are like okay here we go the office is doing it it must be real it's like oh no just kidding you know yeah but as so also anyway was the, the disaster the that was win eight and they had already built office for ios and android and were forced to hold it on yeah. the shelf because windows 8 was going to dominate everything <laughs> and, and then it <laughs> became apparent that it wasn't Yep. And they released it and, and you got the new, you know, I would argue there's several different things. One was Microsoft didn't have a horse in the game for the, for, for the universal windows platform. And yeah. then, uh, and, and the office. Well, they didn't have a universal windows. I mean, right. Like they, windows 8 who, shipped into a world that had windows phone. That was different yeah. code base, different app store, different uh, oh, yeah. guys. Like, no, but that was know. all going to be fixed. Well, it was fixed, but it was, it was yeah, too it late. Just, it didn't matter, yeah, but you know, it didn't matter at that point, but yeah, they, but, the fact that Office then became focused on competing with Google Docs and and the and the yeah. Google Workspace, you sure. know, changed. It, it cared a lot less about Windows at that point. I um uh I, this is this is so unrelated, but yet, yet very related. I was looking up uh open document uh, open Office document formats and right. trying to go back and remember when this happened and how it happened, and what mm -hmm. the deal was, you know. And, you know, uh, as part of it, a story about antitrust and monopoly, because everyone knows about, you know, Microsoft, they got in trouble with monopoly, uh, antitrust, et cetera. Um, the story that doesn't really get told a lot is like uh, Office was, uh, if anything, even more dominant than Windows and it oh, never sure. got in trouble. Why is that? Oh, because they didn't. They, well, well, no, but they were never brought to antitrust court and forced that's to change, you know. So but they, and they the, also the, responded well, right? Like that's they, what I mean. The, and that's what, that, right. And that's one of the things I wanted to look up. One of the reasons yeah. was this notion that Microsoft was going to keep uh, customers hostage by these proprietary office document formats. We forget what a big stink this was, you know, 20 yeah. years ago, whatever. Yeah. And they created the, uh, the formats we Open have today, office. essentially. Yeah. Right. And then there's something out in the world called ODF, the open document mm -hmm. format that's different and arguably in some ways more efficient, but slower. And there's all kinds of whatever. There's a big debate there, but I read this um, article from, I don't know, 2003, 2004, mm -hmm. somewhere in there. And then that sent me down like a rabbit hole of remembering things I had forgotten about, which was basically uh, examples of how Office dodged that bullet by just being pragmatic and right, yeah. making the right decisions. Something we didn't see on the Windows side of the house, something we don't see today with Apple well, facing the, the same The original kind of conflict with Office was when if you, uh, as a PC seller, you could only sell Windows if you paid a license for every single copy of windows and yeah. if you were selling a copy of windows with office it was a lower price than if you sold it only with windows and that was the right. first fdc set that said mm, you know this, yeah you, this, you can't do this and microsoft correctly said okay we won't do that yep. So, yep. as a, you know the the series of blunders that leads to to 2000 to the 1999 decree uh, by uh, the way you know, monopoly declare declaration it was a series of blunders. There was many oh, yeah. off roads that they refused to take. That licensing policy is the reason that IBM doesn't make computers today. Yeah. <laughs> right. But they, they missed the windows 95 launch window. Um, but, but they also had a consent decree in 1977 because they were dominant in the computing industry at the time, you know, like one yeah. leads to the other in the yep. end, all of this is the U S government's fault. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Always say, I would have said, say that. I, I would have said Bill Gates's fault, but okay, that's fine. No, no, um, you know, you know, they starts with the U.S. government selecting COBOL and AS360 as the platform for the IRS and all the other government offices. Right. It means the rest of the industry also likes it, and now IBM dominates the. And then it became Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, right? right. Burroughs and SCO and so forth, and so they end up being declared a monopolistic company and. 
<laughs> get with a consent yeah. decree, much like Microsoft. And that requires them to outsource uh, non-critical things, which is why they outsource the operating system that kicks off Microsoft's path to becoming uh, a monopoly. Okay, fair It's enough. all the U.S. government's fault. Yeah. It's the most complicated board of dominoes ever created. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Interesting. Okay. So this year, uh, look, we've, we've, <laughs> if you've learned the anything in the past five minutes. Show. There have been some ups and downs uh, in <laughs> our industry. And uh, this year is looking, it's like, you know, we've Loppy. had some down years recently. Yeah, it's looking pretty Loppy. good. Yeah. So anyway, there you go. So that's, that's, uh, I, I think the next few months are going to be crucial for the future of Windows. And um, I like what I've seen personally. I like most of what I'm seeing out in the world, right? Just news and whatever and rumors and things. Uh, the stuff Microsoft just today, like I said, came out with the build session list. Very interesting. Um, uh, Richard is correct. It's also very incomplete, but still, the, the st if this is what they're telling us about, like uh, this is going to be some good stuff. Um, so there'll be a Scott Hanselman, Mark Rosinovich session where they build co pilots together, um, uh, in a completely unscripted, uh, impromptu performance, um, which will be. <laughs> Have you <laughs> be, met either of those people? <laughs> which will be entertaining <laughs> and probably education well, you know so. it used to be the snow versus of show now it's the that's right i miss those show. days yeah yeah uh yeah. so all of my workstations were rebooted this morning yes so was my pc interesting yeah, yeah. you say that yeah all of coincidence them. i think not I, I think not no not so much so uh i'm still every... clinging to 10 on two of them <laughs> i want you to know that i i look at windows 10 every day now mm -hmm. i um i don't use it all day every day but i i open it up I check for updates. I, I do some a few little things and I move on. But I, I'm I'm looking at that again, and it's a it's a you know it's, it's a, I wouldn't call it nostalgic, but um, there are things to like there for sure. Um, Tuesday was Patch Tuesday. Um, if you're only half paying attention to this show, which by the way, I'm with you. I completely I'm only paying half attention. I get it. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of there's a lot of confusion. You might have thought. That Microsoft released something called Moment 5 two months ago, you might have thought that they released it last month. And now you might think they released it this month because they did. Um, you know, these things happen in different ways now than they used to. We don't really have that hard RTM or GA date, that general availability date, um, per se. <laughs> you know, um, thanks to CFRs, these controlled feature releases, some parts of feature bundles come out at different times on different PCs. It's the way of the world. You know, Google actually does the same thing, by the way. I don't like it. I don't like the style of updating. Um, but on Tuesday, yesterday, as we record this, what they call Moment 5 internally, which is a bundle of new features and one of the smaller moments uh, from an impact perspective, um, arrived in what I've been calling the stable channel. It, by the way, this thing actually has a name. It's called the general availability channel, speaking of GA. I love so when you think, names. I know. So when you think about the canary, and dev and beta and release preview general availability. That's the stable channel. That's what we're on as, you know, individuals or uh, businesses, consumers, whatever. Um, I, I feel like I, this happens to me a lot because the nature of what I do, I'm writing books and things. And so I, I, I don't, I, my computer rebooted, like you said, like yours did. And of course I'm looking at it. Is there anything new? Is there, and there isn't. And, you know, I, even the stable release of this thing to the world has not triggered the opening up of new features that I can notice anyway. So we'll see. Um, the list of features that are in Moment 5 is not particularly particularly interesting. Um, there is one I'm looking forward to. This is two features related to the PC uh, Link app. Is that the right term? PC Link? Yeah, nope, the, phone link. The, what do I call it? PC link. Phone link PC yeah. link being a 1990s uh, serial cable thing that you laptop, whatever. Um, worse. <laughs> phone link. Worse um, one is that when if your phone is near your computer and you take a screenshot, you'll get a notification. Uh, this has to be an Android phone, sorry, iPhone guys, uh, on your computer that it's linked to, right? And so that you can do something with it right on your computer. So if, if that's a thing for you, like that's kind of cool. But the one I'm really looking forward to is actually a feature that's available to Pixel users today through Pixel, uh, not through the operating system, where you can use your Android-based phone as a webcam with your Windows computer. That's cool. Um, that's a great idea because yeah. phones have terrific, terrific uh, cameras. cameras, a lot of them. And do. more than one, really. 
Yep. And uh, th- I, it is, by the way, just uh, as a goofy side note, coincidence, um, Apple obviously has this feature. I think it's called continuity or something. Mm-hmm. And one of the continuity features is you can use your iPhone as the webcam for your Mac. And um, we just did a call last night with um, friends of ours in Mexico for someone's birthday. We have an Apple TV in our living room. And I said, here's an idea. We're going to do it on FaceTime, right? I'm like, I will put the ba- I'll put the laptop there, the MacBook. I'll, I'll attach the phone to the back of it. They use that as the camera. We'll mm-hmm. put air, pl- what do you call it? <laughs> Airplay or whatever it is. The screen or extend the screen to the to the tv this is going to be awesome it's going to be this multimedia experience you know yeah uh we ended up just doing it on the laptop get everything else <laughs> i just said but the the thing that's interesting is <laughs> for the variety of technical problems but um on the mac at least uh, i thought the quality of the built-in webcam was better than my phone <laughs> i can't yeah. explain that but that's not the case if you have a pixel or and basically any modern um unless you have a crazy professional camera almost certainly that thing is going to be a better uh, camera than your webcam. So kind of a cool feature. I, I, to my knowledge, it's not available yet. It's coming. It will be here soon. It's, I don't have it. Anyway, so that's the one I'm looking forward to. That's cool. Yeah, I've been using the OBS webcam since we moved here. I've never pulled out the big uh, Canon yeah. XC10. But right. The the new desk arrives this weekend, so I get to tear the whole room down and rebuild it. So it's like, is it time? Actually, yeah, you might as well yeah. drag out the, you know, yeah. Where it's like, wow, I love your background blur. blur. And it's like, that's f stops. That's bokeh. <laughs> <That's laughs> literal, yeah. That's a, a camera lens. Yeah, <laughs> that's how that lens works. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, I get I, more than once uh, this just the past few months. People, some uh, set of people, a couple of people said to me, "So you must have like a crazy SLR or something, something." No. No. And 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 that's the thing I like about this little obs camera. And this thing's so small, right. I could lose it up my nose. It, yeah. And, but it's pretty good, good, you know, yeah, like the difference, the incremental difference between this and that big old XC10, like it's hard to justify. Then again, and I feel bad having that thing sit in my bag. Like right. it, it deserves better. Yeah, but you travel enough that it's important. You know, that's the right, you know, it's fine. It's like, yeah, I have no. a USB hub I travel with. I don't ever use it here, but I, it's awesome when you have it, you know? Yeah. It's, I would yeah. argue I should be traveling with this little, this little cam rather than the than the flex cam because it's even smaller so oh, we'll figure it Interesting. out Interesting. my portable rig continues to get crazier i always uh been counting on and been disappointed by it not happening the notion that the the camera and a laptop will eventually be so good it won't matter and of course yeah. laptop lids are actually very thin yeah and so um, room. they're thinner than phones right but this is another area where ai may play a role in making it good enough for yeah. most people right where through some combination of on the fly, uh, as uh, oversampling or what do you got? Like over, uh, what do you, uh, um, you yeah, know, upscaling. making it appear to be better quality, right? Yeah. Um, it may be okay. So yeah, I know, I think you could do it. Yeah. It's going to save the world and then it's going to destroy it because Terminator. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, <laughs> so. I, I like the, you know, nobody wants to use the physical enhancement features that thing could do, but if you got to upscale anyway, why don't we just touch up? Yeah, I know. Yeah. You don't want to look 29 again? Really? Mm-hmm. I mean, come on. Look how good you um, are. I'll just do it for you. <laughs> I don't, I, I, I think you do this too, because you're on camera a lot. I, yeah. I, I spend a lot of time screwing around with these settings and I try third party yeah. apps and I do different things, you know, and I almost always just go back to like, yeah, whatever. Like it's the just de- not. The defaults it, are usually right. Yeah. Usually. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, well, Their I got, defaults for you know, a reason. We've, we've, we've got the, the Kevin, the crew in our, uh, are on us. So it's like, you know, I care more about color temperature in the past year than I know. The, the previous <laughs> I tell, 50 something. I told, so Leo's, Leo's back. I, I want to tell the story in Leo's mm-hmm. presence because oh, he'll, oh. he'll, he'll appreciate this. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll tell the shorter version of it. But when I was in Mexico, one of the pro- there's problems with Mexico because it's a big echoey room. Yeah. And we wanted to, uh, you know, paint and we're going to put things on the wall. And I, hopefully this is the stuff that gets it over the top, whatever. But I, for the two years we've been there, haven't really had this whole kind of nice microphone setup. And, but what we do have is these little, uh, Lavier, you know, wireless mm-hmm. mic things, which I have tested in every configuration imaginable and sound wonderful. They sound wonderful. And I, and I know Leo hates wireless. He hates, you know, it's not he, just the wireless, it's their omnidirectional. Yep. There's all kinds of stuff. And yeah. I thought to myself, you know what I'm going to, I'm just going to, I'm going to, I'm just going to try it one time. I'm just going to. 
I'm going to just try it and see, I'm going to see if he thinks it's okay. I'm just going to actually try it. And so <laughs> I, that day, Richard was late or wasn't, couldn't make it. I don't remember exactly, but you weren't here for the start of the show. So Leo shows up and he says, Hey, how you doing? And everything. I'm like, good. I, I'm, I'm, I said, I'm fine, but I've got some bad news. And this thing, he goes, Oh, is it that you're on the wrong mic? <laughs> like, <laughs> like that. And I'm like, Oh, <laughs> so that was the end of that. So, you know, that stuff matters. You know, it matters, right? You gotta, you know, you gotta <laughs> only in podcasting. <laughs> it's just it's classic. And only I mean, it was so and only instantaneous. Yeah. Like yeah. it was perfect. You know, I'm sure Richard, you did the same with your shows. <laughs> oh yeah. No, I'm very, the number important. of times. The other time I've got, I see a guest who's got a, you know, a Yeti or something in front of him and he's talking, yeah. I'm like, dude, you haven't selected the right microphone. It's like, how do you know? It's like, oh, I know. Yep. It's like, There's tap a weird that microphone thing in the world. and you can't hear it. So it's like, it, okay. Since the pandemic, you could watch, you know, CNN or whatever, NBC, whatever news thing you watch. And there'll be some guy wearing a shirt and a tie and he's probably got his underwear on, a, you know, with no pants, but you only see the top half of his body. He's at home. In front of us, something, something, you know, maybe his kid or dog disturbs it, maybe not. But they'll often have like, they're just wearing like AirPods and, you know, like people will sometimes use what looks like the most ridiculous equipment. It's like, that actually sounds pretty good. Yeah. You know, for some reason, it's kind of hard to explain, but I don't know. I can anyway, tell. I, I can tell. Yeah, no, I don't. I, 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 I know so you bad. can. I don't. It's I do so not bad. doubt your powers. Yeah. I hate <laughs> TV Leo's, audio. Leo's expertise in this area is and when uh, I see people question. wearing AirPods, I go, oh, oh, <laughs> no, don't do it. Don't do it. Yeah. But, but this is the latest news? state of the art like technology from Apple. It's got oh, yeah, to be yeah. good. Yeah, I don't know. I, I love, a, a, you know, a, an MSNBC interview where the guest is remote and they've also got their TV on. So you get the echo. Yes. Right? Like, I just know <laughs> that engineer is losing oh. his mind. Oh. <laughs> Can I get into his earpiece, please? Yeah, you know. Yeah. Notice all three of us though are using Bob yes. Hiles, beautiful the late um, Bob Hiles, yeah. beautiful mic. I, I wish there was a I, this was sent to me by a very nice like man. I, <laughs> like, I, I, yeah, and it sounds. I noticed. Good. Um, I noticed this fantastic. is kind of a bronze gold color, and mine's kind yeah. of more plain. Yeah, I have a special a, uh, special edition. Nice nice yeah. Yeah. Bob and I were good friends. Uh, yeah. Well, and I told you the story that when you sent this to me, the first time I was I was going to record with Carl, he's like. What's that microphone? And immediately ordered one. Yeah, good. Like yeah. And then we had to reshoot all the ads. Oh no, because <laughs> so, it yeah. sounded right, so, so good. <laughs> my my version of this is that again, since the pandemic, you do a lot of things online that used to be in person. And that includes like doctor visits and stuff like this. I've had three different doctors, like a sleep doctor, an eye doc, not an eye doctor. I'm sorry, a uh, just the general doctor, and I don't know what the other one was, but the and they're all like. I, they're like, are you, are you on the radio or something? Like, what is, yeah. what's this, what's <laughs> the, this the, setup? Yeah. You know, and I'm like, no, I just, I just work from home. I don't know. Yeah. You know, there, there is a look anytime I see on MSNBC, there is a look and I know immediately podcaster because they yeah. have yeah. this thing. They yeah, have a yeah. big microphone in their face. Yeah, they yeah. have, they have a broadcast. They're right. hands. Yeah. Podcaster. Yep. Yeah. It's obvious. Sure. Or if they're, they have all the color lights in the back, you're like YouTuber. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Twitcher. You can always tell. Yep. Yeah. It's a species. All right. Uh, we talked about the beta about. channel. Yes. Uh, general availability. Oh, no. So uh, uh, we've been waiting for the PC market to rebound. Mm -hmm. um, you should read this IDC report. It's hilarious. They they acted like the, the there's been a turnaround of like historic proportions. Uh, PC sales grew 1.5% year over year. Oh, boy. To a year that was so bad comparably that everyone experienced massive double digit year over year drops, including Apple. <laughs> So right. I'm like, I don't know what you're comparing. Yeah, but it's up. For that. I mean, the big thing is it the direction, right? It's going. Have you up, ever looked at down. what 1.5% looks like on yeah, a graph, Leo? It's yeah. basically if you if your if your heart stopped and then the doctor said, "Hold on, it's up 1.5%," I don't. You'd be dead. You'd still, <laughs> still be, you know, you'd still still be dead. dead. PC market, you're 1.5% less dead. <laughs> I would call that flat. Yeah, but still, you know, whatever. It's okay. It's not negative. It's not down seven percent or sixteen or thirty, whatever it was, to, you know, a while ago. So, hey, um, it has the been. Psychologists say two percent is the threshold of notice. So, one point five percent, not a threshold of notice. Yeah, that was my. Yeah, I didn't know that figure, but that I, yeah. to me, one point anything is flat. Yeah, but below the that's threshold. okay. You know what? Yeah. I get it. It's fine. Uh, yeah. Lenovo still number one. HP is still number two. Dell still number three, and, and Apple still number four. So yeah. there you go. Yeah, nothing's changed. Nothing has changed. Yeah. Uh, so that's that. Um, 
there, this one, I, I don't, this is one of those fog of war things. I, I'm, I'm not happy with the, you know, Microsoft is not super transparent with this kind of stuff, but they're starting to block access to registry keys, hmm. which are tied to features in windows that are probably we've seen are going to, are probably going to disappear in 24 H two, which right. today are used by companies like not, not by Stardock, interestingly, but companies that make third party utilities to change the uh, taskbar or the start menu or file explorer back to the old versions. Cause that code is still in windows. Right. And, um, they haven't done a, the deprecation job. I think they need to, which is come out publicly and say, here's the timeline. If you're using this stuff, stop, you know, um, yeah, I wonder if they're communicating with them privately. Cause that seems to be more of their style these days too, is that they literally, I mean, it. well, I, based on the reaction of these companies to this stuff, yes, no. the answer is no, because yeah. the, the, the people who are reporting this are the ones who make these apps. Right. Yeah, there was totally. a, uh, a the guy from is coming. Uh, he's like, I, I've never seen anything quite like this. Now, the good news is, uh, for now you can, you can work around the blocks. Uh, so meaning so the the makers of these apps can can get around this and make it work and then there are, of course there's always the apologists you always get the uh the guys who are like oh, everything microsoft does is great i don't see what the problem is you know like who uh, are defending this because oh maybe this behavior could be used to you don't want um you don't want like a third party app changing your default browser do you i'm like i'm running windows 11 who cares what my default browser is windows 11 doesn't care what my browser is it doesn't yeah. respect that choice whatever the purpose or, or whatever, this is happening. The problem is going to be when 24 H two arrives. And if as expected, this code is been removed, we're going to have a whole family a of stuff is going to break. Third party yeah. utilities are going to stop working. Yeah. And, and customers who are going to go, Oh, so don't install 24 H two. Yep. <laughs> so we'll see how that works out. I'm not, I am not advocating for Microsoft to leave legacy code in windows necessarily. I don't mean it like that, but then yeah. again, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> the .NET Framework 4. Point whatever is still in there. 4.8 will be there forever. The has existed forever. The and VB runtime from 1999 is yeah, in I there mean, forever. Yeah. What one of the one of the many antitrust arguments against Apple is its kind of selective um, uh, distribution of APIs to third parties and how it gives itself some of its own, you know, mm -hmm. APIs to it only for itself, right? That kind of thing. And because it has this stranglehold on the market, um, it can do this you know, it can engage in that kind of behavior. And, and in some ways this feels reminiscent of that. Yeah. And didn't I, Microsoft I just, invent that? I mean, yeah, they did. Seriously. Yeah. There was a whole yeah. windows secrets yeah. books. Right? Well, so uh, yeah, th there's two sides. So th there's the, there were, there have always rumors that my, that Microsoft had backdoors in windows, right. For the government, that was the big one, right. The C uh, CIA or the NSA could get into the back door in windows, you know, and also that there were secret APIs, you know, um, Microsoft has always disputed this, uh, always. And, uh, and there's been no, you know, uh, look, the Microsoft windows, uh, code base is available to, uh, governments, to <laughs> software part. If you want to, you know, you, you, people have been able to see for themselves, like this isn't necessarily true, but this is the stuff from the consent decree in 2001. I think that, yeah, a lot of this stuff, honestly, it's tied to what we were talking earlier about Microsoft as a company being big and complex and how these things, they're not in some in concert army marching together to do the mm -hmm. same song. I mean, a lot of this stuff is vestigial, just left over. You know, it just happens to be there. As a developer on the outside, you'd be like, oh, look, I found this awesome API that does something really fun and I can make this app. It's really cool. Um, and then that API disappears in some next version of Windows. And then, like you complain, I guess, but I mean, but they didn't document it and yeah. we can, you know, we're, we're naturally inclined to believe, um, you know, conspiracy theory. So I don't know. I, it, so there I, I know are Microsoft undocumented well APIs, right? There, there are yeah, APIs course. they don't publish. Yep. Well, that's, you know, I mean, that's just like there are, just like there are VMs out there that weren't properly locked down and the Chinese got in. It's nobody's fault, Leo. It's just, it just happens. It's just, These things happen. <laughs> it's just, it just happens. It's mistakes. Democracy is messy. I don't know made. what am I looking at? Uh, the, uh, yes. <laughs> you know, it's, I don't know. Um, it's not necessarily malicious. I guess is all I'm saying. Yeah. It's, no, no, it, no. it might just be I, stupid or, or intentional, but it's, I mean, it's not illegal it's to one have of an the undocumented it API. It could be both. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we have API calls on our, you know, our, uh, back end that are not public, you know, we don't want right. other people using. Yep. 
Um, I, more often than not, though, honestly, I, I think a lot of this, the, these undock. So, for example, like uh, uh, the Windows taskbar and start menu used to be a thing and it was evolved and over time. And then Windows 11 happened and those things were actually rewritten from scratch. But because different code in the operating system accesses code in those code bases in many ways, the, the code's still there. Right. So third party apps that take advantage of it can also use it. Um, but at some point, you know, Microsoft is working behind the scenes to get rid of those connections and they want to get rid of that code base because it's not really right. it's being maintained sort of, but it's not secure. It's not actively. They being never developed. advertised it. So maybe they yep. don't feel like. They no, I know. I, I'm not anybody. I'm not taking anyone's side. I'm just saying that. The, the, well, I'm sort of the side I'm taking is that there's a responsible way you can handle this, which is to say, look. This is what we're doing. Right. Here's the time frame. It's kind of like the new outlook thing. Everyone hates the new outlook. I, I completely get it. But the one thing I will say to this is they've been very clear about them not getting rid of the thing you love until this new thing that you hate <laughs> does everything the old thing did. And it's going to be 29, uh, no, was it 2029 at the earliest? So at least there's clarity to this, right? Like it's uh, you may not agree with the decision, but at least they have a time frame, and it's probably going to go well past that. Um, this kind of stuff silence right they've never really talked about it what so brad say? i feel like they I should mean, just oh this is a, for him use it they don't use it he's like he loves this he wants this to happen as quickly as possible every one of his competitors is going to drop off the face of the earth when this happens <laughs> they're so, smart you know, starduck's smart they don't yeah play tricks right right intentionally well, they might play tricks but they don't, <laughs> don't what they do. i'm not gonna it's brad i mean come on no i i uh <laughs> tricks i'm no, I mean, I they're just not using those APIs. So that that was a good decision on their part. It required a little bit more work, right? They have to recreate these things, you know, themselves. But that was the right thing to do. So they must have sensed they, that this is not; these are not public APIs. Well, I, these are not documents. realistically speaking. You could see it was going to happen. Gonna I get. Go I don't away. know yeah. any. I don't know Windows at this deep of a level, but I think with each new build, through each, you know, beta channel, whatever, you can see as things change, and you can see over time they've been removing their dependencies. Uh, in house, and at some point they're like, well, yeah, we don't need the old taskbar code anymore, mm -hmm. so they're going to get rid of it. It's just taking up space, and is potentially a security vulnerability. Well, imagine so, the concept of Windows actually getting smaller over time. Wow, That's, what a thought! I, I just uh, no, they will they, but then they threw Copilot in too, so they they make up for it. You know, it's it's, it's they'll pad it with other crap. It's okay. <laughs> um, I like Copilot. <laughs> Copilot's your friend. So. <laughs> Actually, I do. Oh, I didn't. You know what? I didn't put this in the. Uh, uh, did I? I don't think I have a big AI thing. I don't think I even put it in the AI. I'll, I'll add it later. Okay. So I have a co pilot thing I, I actually should talk about. Um, not too much has happened on the Windows Insider front in the past week. The day of the show last week, there were Canary and Dev bills. Remember, they're temporarily on the same boat. Uh, 24H2 is about if, if they ever would agree to call it RTM, it's going to happen any time now. Um, there was a beta channel build update since then. That was last week, not today. Um, nothing major there. The, there were some improvements to the Copilot actions. Uh, Copilot actions of those things in Copilot for Windows that integrate with the command, uh, the features and settings of the operating system, not the broader Copilot stuff. Um, unfortunately, that means they're inherently uninteresting, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> because to date those things have kind of sucked. So that's too bad, but whatever. Um, there's going to be some, they're, they're, they're trying different things. I, my, my problem is they're trying things in real time. Like at least this is happening in the insider program, but yeah, because of the way things have gone over the past year or so, you, you we're going to see this in stable like any week now. Right. Mm. So you have a, I mean, um, I'm just glad they're trying things, right? Like if they, they, I'm, they no, that's what I mean. I am glad they're trying things. I want them to follow the path, but I feel like AI, especially, but Windows too, right, is on this accelerated path where it, it oh, it's like the old joke. Oh, it compiled, yeah, ship it, you know that kind of thing. So they're testing things like you've copied a an image to the clipboard, and then the icon for Copilot changes to indicate that you can do something with that image in Copilot, like. Um, mm -hmm create a similar image or uh, tell me something about this image or whatever the capabilities are there. So it's fine. I, I, I think, uh, yeah, you know, you want to advance this feature. It's garbage right now, so it's fine. But I, I my worry is because based on history, they will just, you know, it, June will come and we'll all have this feature in stable because that's how they've been doing things, but we will see. Um, the other change, which is not a new build, but impacts, I think, basically all of the channels of the Windows Insider program is a major update to the store app, the Microsoft Store app, mm. where they've um, 
I don't know how they've done it, but they've made some kind of major performance improvements where um, navigating between pages is 35% faster than it was wow. before somehow. So a rewrite, um, it sounds like. Yeah. This is a, see if I can remember this correctly. I was talking to um, Raphael about this. There, mm -hmm. There's uh, in, no one normal would ever care about this, but no one normal is listening to the show. So I'll say it <laughs> um, in, in windows there are all these different inbox apps and they're built with different right. technologies. So we have this kind of archeological scale of things. If you would look at the movies and TV app, for example, is a great is maybe not the only, but one of the remaining vestigial remainders from windows eight, right? This is right. a, an old school UI. It's, it's, uh, it's probably an early version of UWP or whatever. It's never been updated, which makes me nervous about its future. Um, and then we have, uh, apps like uh, last week microsoft said i don't know why they even said this publicly but they're updating the photos app and they're bringing it from uwp to the windows app sdk right Interesting. we have web apps like um, clip champ we have still desktop apps we have hybrid apps file explorer is a classic win32 desktop app but it has a win ui3 front end and a tailored internal version of win app sdk that enables the uis um, that was why we lost drag and drop support in the uh, address bar in the last release and why we're going to get it back in the next release because they're retroactively fixing uh, things that they break. So there's this kind of spectrum of app types just within Windows. Forget about apps you install in Windows, but right. the apps that comes with Windows. And th those shift over time. Um, the Microsoft Store app, the one that was just updated, is still a UWP app, right? Right. I would have expected it's that this was a see web them app, moving but... stuff off of UWP. Like, oh yeah, like they have to, right? I mean, yeah. they have to. I mean, it's you know, there's there's. I would like it if like they're a... rebuilding it in Maui. Like that would that would advance Maui. I am. I'm waiting to see. See, I, I, it's not easy. I wish there was some command line you could run and it would give you the list of what yeah. was what. I'd love yeah. to see that, but um, I look at the apps and Windows. Debugger would let you do that, but it's complicated. Yeah, right. I'm looking for why, something like, simpler, but. When WPF was an orphan until Visual Studio implemented it for 2010. Yes. Like, that's and, right. And the difference between WPF2 and WPF4, mm -hmm. because numbers are hard, yeah. um, which was the next version after two. Yep. At, and it was the one that was caused by Visual Studio, was just dramatically better because right. the studio team beat the snot out it, of it. And, right. And they know where those guys so, live. Like they hunted them down and said, you will fix this. In, in its own small way, um, File Explorer has had this impact on yeah. native app development in Windows because they wanted to do whatever it was. They they had whatever mm -hmm. code base, legacy code base. Right? So the legacy is a, probably a C++ app from a yeah. million years ago. And when UI is happening at that time, it was when UI 2 and they wanted to make this thing look modern. It's yeah. an app modern part of Windows. It, and... Um, their Microsoft solution for this type of thing at the time was something called XAML Islands, which mm -hmm. anyone who's ever used this will tell you was, was garbage. But internally at Microsoft, the File Explorer team used it and it was so bad. They had to make their own version of it that only worked for File Explorer and was not something they could reproduce for anyone else. It was very specific to their needs. And now, of course, they've moved to the Windows app SDK. They've actually had to do kind of the same thing. It's not a full rewrite or anything like that, but it's it's still not like vanilla windows app sdk and uh I, I this is the type of real world stress test that i think products these apis don't typically get yeah and it, it and well, they used to get all the time the, and this is why most microsofties are dog fooding all the time like because they will talk to the other teams and press against them and know how to communicate with them and yeah uh, yeah and it, and it makes we all benefit from that when it's so comes, to your point it, I, works well I, it's funny they mentioned this. I was just thinking this when I was having this conversation with Raphael about which apps were which and what you know how were they made, et cetera. Mm -hmm. they're, they're these smaller apps in Windows, things like Calculator, right? Yeah. Where I'm like, you know, this would, this would be a good candidate for like a Maui app, right? Mm -hmm. But the thing is, like, the the point of Maui ultimately is cross platform, and that's not important. Why bother? You know, like yeah. why? I, I mean, know. I would argue. Maui is strong on iOS and Android because that's where it comes from. And making yep. more stuff in Windows would make the Windows implementation better. But and yeah. Yeah, Maui is, uh, you know, this. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying this for Rich's mm -hmm. sake. He knows better than I do. But Maui to me is on a very kind of a slow boat rollout kind of a thing. And and every release, they'll be like, here's what's new on desktop. Here's what's new here and everything. And they've made concessions for the desktop that I think mm -hmm. are good, but it, it doesn't feel 
it's not the type of thing that would happen. It would be, there'd be far more going on if that was the focus, yeah. right? I think what you're seeing is the customer feedback coming in, shifting the politics of how the layers work. Yeah. So, you know, that, that it also, a, it's an integration product. A lot of different teams touch it and that, you know, yeah. you have, a, you sort of have a UN effect going on here. Where they, <laughs> well, they all have to get together in, in a room and advocate and it takes a while. Yep. When it was, um, uh, what was it called before? XAML, uh, I mean, um, Xamarin forms. Yes. Um, the focus was, was, was straight up mobile, right? So we had, you know, windows phone yeah. and it was and also mobile and Miguel Diacaza and he has that Gatesian gravity where he could just say, I think we're gonna do it this way. And everybody did it that way. And that's gone. No, no, I, I right. I, 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 you're right. I mean, hundred percent. I, I love those guys, but yeah, there's, they don't have that, that guy. They don't have an icon leading yeah. this. Yeah. Um, it's, but, it's but there's a, with a group of people, there's a shift occurring in mobile too, where, uh, Android is adapting to over years to bigger screens, like mm -hmm. on Chromebooks and tablets. Uh, Apple did this years ago with iPad, but they're also adopting kind of, um, desktop class UIs. And so there are certain desktop features now that be, before it was windows phone, iPhone, uh, Android. And now you could actually do, you could make the case that there are windows features, windows desktop features where it's windows desktop, iPad, Android tablet, and a Chromebook where these, you know, um, what we might think of as jump lists or accelerated keys or whatever they might be like these things we're doing more with keyboards now with those devices. And so maybe we need shortcuts and stuff like that. I mean, uh, there, there are definitely things that, you know, that, uh, that Maui has addressed, but I think there's definitely things that also, you know, still need to be addressed. Sure. Especially on the desktop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We'll see. I'd love to see a Maui part. app come up and in box well, and windows. Right. I mean, the kicker on this too, is if I don't know how much you pay attention to flutter, but you know, mm -hmm. flutter had iOS and Android nailed and now they're working hard to make a good right. windows implementation. That's right. And I like it when there's a nice threat from the left like that. that like, that's actually what it needs. I, I, I the fl better. Flutter, I feel, uh, first, I mean, uh, Tim Sneath, by the way, Tim Sneath is it. that Apple now, you know, the love him, still love yeah, yeah, still Was he guy. the guy who created Flutter? He was one of the No, well, he ran it. He was one of the drivers. Oh, okay. yeah. This is an ex-Microsoft uh, yeah, guy. An excellent leader of development. Did he go to Apple to do a language? To do language stuff? Yeah, no, he's doing, uh, he is in the developer part. He's doing, um, what is he doing? Uh, did, did, I think he, I don't Switch? know if it's uh, Xcode or it's something. Yeah, Switch. something developers. Uh, huh. You could look him up. Look up if you look him up on Twitter. Over there. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But he, he'll be part of. He'll be part of WWDC. He was a good public face for Flutter. Yeah, I think that Flutter may have helped Maui a little bit. They, they, I think they might have spread themselves a little too thin. They were like, now we're going to do everything <laughs> at the same time, and it's like, what are you doing? I mean, it's just they're. I think they're targeting too many platforms um, at once. But it, there, there is this n over n minus one problem. As the number of platforms increases uh, incrementally, the complexity goes up and yep. logarithmically. Well, but uh, but for a developer, the uh, the dream of that that Java thing, you know, write once, run everywhere, it get, becomes even more important, right? Uh, it becomes even more desirable. So if they can nail it, mm -hmm. if anyone can figure this out, whether it's a React Native or Flutter or Maui or whatever it is, like this is this is the dream, right? Yeah. If someone could just yeah. nail this. Yeah, oh, and, then, and the fact that there are so many solutions in this space just shows it's not well solved. Right. Going yeah. back to oh, Java, no, if it was, I mean, we, that was the point of Java, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. Right once, run everywhere. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Right, right, right once, debug everywhere. <laughs> I'm sorry, did I say that out loud? That's supposed to be the inside voice. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't, I don't, make, I don't tease Java people anymore. They have to live with Oracle. That's enough torment. Oh, they have to live with Java. That's enough torment. Mm -hmm. I, Mary Jo loves telling the story about the time we were in, uh, we were in San Francisco, I think it was for the Windows 10 uh, announcement event and there were no rooms because there was an Oracle event occurring. And I went, we went into some hotel and I'm like, what are all these friggin' people doing here? I had to get a hotel in the middle of nowhere. And she's like, oh, they're here for this uh, Oracle event. I'm like, Oracle. And she's like, yeah, they like Java developers. I'm like, are you serious? I stood up on a chair and I said, attention, Java developers. <laughs> the whole room just like stopped. Look at you. Like, I got, you are wasting your lives. <laughs> oh, you're so bad. That is not right. Oh, that's so mean. I'm wasting yep. my life all the way to the bank. Thanks. Yeah. Very yeah. Much. yeah. They There's are a market. very well it's like, paid. Um, yeah, yeah. They're like, yeah, they're like the new COBOL developer oh, yeah. or whatever. Jeez, Louise. There's nothing better than being in, in a market that's slightly declining with the young when the young and excitable have already left. Yeah. And you're like, so how much yeah. are you gonna pay me yeah. to keep your stuff alive? Yeah, no, senior right. yeah, Java yeah. developer. No, I, yeah. Starts There's something seven to that. figures. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. 
But you know what? The job is not something I think about a lot these days. Obviously, who would? Runs but every once in a while, I, I it's everywhere. I, sometime in the past year or so, I had to install the J, the Java probably for Android development or something. There's like a Java SDK that Oracle has, and then there's yeah. like a free version that Open someone else JDK. makes. Oy. Open GDK. Yeah. I installed the 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 Oracle one, and I was like, "Oh no, no, this is no. What is this? <laughs> this is I'm this is what Adobe Acrobat Acrobat used to be like <laughs> in the 1990s. This is not okay. Like this is garbage. Like it's hot garbage, and like it is, if anything, worse than it was that day in 2015. And then there's that that three billion devices run Java graphic that never seems to change the number or go away. And the problem is the, the slide is cut off because the word at the end is badly and no one, <laughs> you know, you don't get the got, whole message. Yeah. You got to You got to let it's like a, you know, like when they used to crop movies for TVs, you'd get the square version. <laughs> Uh, I mean, <laughs> slide, slide has been adjusted to fit your preconceptions. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. This mark, you know, the marketing for this product has been adjusted to meet the width of your screen. <laughs> nice. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to go into this a lot because ultimately I failed, but I spent uh, a lot of the last week on it. And I mean like literally every waking hour working with windows 11 enterprise to find out whether this might using this version of the product might help solve the insurtification problems with windows 11. I am depressed to tell you that it does not, mm. but it did cause me to um, kind of enumerate what those issues are and then also apply severity levels to each of them. So, in, you know, we'll all have different oh, lists. So you've guess, ranked right? your frustrations. I appreciate it. Yeah. This. Yeah. It's like, you know, I opened the door to the closet and I made the big monster stand in the back and I'm, you know, I kind of just arranged them a little bit. Yes. And um, I will say just, just for whatever it's worth for me, the major issues are, what I think of as harassment, which is you change mm. settings and it tries to get you to go back or uh, it just the worst one of all, ignoring the choice that you made where OneDrive silently just, you know, do you want to enable folder backup? Nope. Hey, uh, you should enable folder backup. No, thanks. You reboot. Hey, you know what? I, we're just throwing it out there. Do you want to enable folder backup? Nope. I'm good. <laughs> and then it just does it. It's just, it's just tired of you saying no. And it just <laughs> enables itself. And I, that's indefensible, you know? So there's some stuff. It's like you know, people will complain, uh, complain about the uh, forced telemetry. Yeah, you know, who cares? I, to me, that's not a privacy issue. Um, it's you know, we're we, we're trying to make Windows better. There may be some laziness involved to it. On some vague level, I do agree. I should be able to turn it off if I feel that strongly about it. But personally, I don't care about that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. I don't know. Anyway, we have some solutions to problems. You know, Tiny11 is one. Uh, there are workarounds. You know, if you want to sign into Windows with a local account and not a Microsoft account like Microsoft really wants you to do, um, you can work around most of that stuff. But it's, it, it, there are some problems that are really bad. You know, Microsoft Edge is a particular form of cancer that I found uh, very troubling. And uh, it's amazing to me when people push back against this. But if you don't choose to use Microsoft Edge, they will force you to use Microsoft Edge. If you do choose to use Microsoft Edge, it will just keep bothering you with little pop-ups and says, oh, do you want to put Bing back as the, you know, they, they'll never stop harassing. Like Bing will never stop harassing you. I have to move to France to fix this problem. <laughs> so I, 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 I would, I would like, I would like to see, I think the DMA being applied worldwide might be the, yeah. The solution but i don't well, the funny I thing is it's like this is what drives you off of edge is it won't stop nagging you unless you run it exactly the way it wants you to run it i, I this is not gratifying uh, like it maybe should be <laughs> but um it is interesting to me that in recent weeks days even uh i've started to get emails from people like paul i don't know if you've seen this but um or if anyone else has complained but i, I just I turned off folder backup in OneDrive and it, I swear to God, I know this sounds crazy. It turned itself on and I'm like, <laughs> oh, you're so cute. I've been talking about this <laughs> since September. Sweet like child. people think I'm an insane person and maybe I am, but I. Separate issues. Separate, completely separate <laughs> issues, right? Like, um, I, guys, this is my point. I'm glad, I'm, I'm not glad you're seeing it. Like I don't want other people to suffer this way, but I, it's important to me that other people see it because someone important is going to see it and complain and then maybe we'll get it fixed because right now it's it's hot garbage and it makes me sad okay like i said i i didn't i'm, I'm going to try not to, to focus too much the on that but I spent is, all, and we're and we're about a year away from support from win 10 ending right or no they push it down to october the, now it right. used to be april now well, it's october i sorry that, that was my installation of windows 10 was yet was another attempt like will this solve the problem what if yeah. i just use windows 10 yeah, it solves yeah. some of the problems. It doesn't solve all the problems. Okay. So we're 18 months out. <sighs> yep. 
Yeah, you could pay 61 bucks and make it a year and a half or two and a half years, I guess. <laughs> there you go. Let's um, uh, let's pause the pause that refreshes Windows Weekly with uh, fabulous pause Therat and uh, Richard Campbell and all the windows and dozers who are in our Discord chat and Club Twit members. We thank you so much for your support. If you're not yet a Club Twit member, please, I beg of you, <laughs> before it's too late, Seven dollars a month will get you all of the benefits, ad-free versions, the Discord chat, the special stuff we still do just for uh, uh, our club members. Of course, Paul Thorat's uh, Hands on Windows is now public. I hope people know that and subscribe. Uh, but it's I audio have to start only. Start tailoring it for audio somehow. It's it's such well, a visual. Describe show. Describe what you're doing, you know? maybe. But uh, honestly, if you want the video, just subscribe to the club, then you'll get it. That's true for. All of the shows now that we were, you know, keeping the whole show behind the paywall, hands on Windows. I'm just going to read one. the book now. I think I'll just, just read the book two. out loud. Microsoft Chapter two, Edge. page five. <laughs> in, Edge. The beginning, in the beginning, there was Internet Explorer. Uh, anyway, we're glad to have you uh, in the club if you already are. And if you're not, twit.tv slash uh, club twit. You people, I probably should mention, you might have noticed we took away the year-long subscription. I asked Lisa to do that. Because every time nope. somebody signed up for that, it means, in my heart, I had to go another year. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> wow. Well, We've uh, reached this point. I didn't, it's in actually the career. not me. I'm like, I'm just going to stare at the sun during the uh, eclipse. I don't care anymore. I'm more I'm comfortable with month to month. I don't want to have to, you know, I don't want to <clears> disappoint <throat> anybody. We honestly like don't know if we'll be here in a year. I will. But uh, the lights might not be on. <laughs> so... Uh, we just thought, you know what, let's go back to month to month. It's the same price anyway. And I apologize to people who only want that one credit card charge. It also was causing us problems with chargebacks because for some reason, yeah. people people would... Well, uh, you know, a year goes by and you forget and then you get this yeah. bill and you're like, what yeah. the hell is this? You and know, it was like, spouses yeah. in many cases. It would say, what's this, $84? And mm -hmm. they do a chargeback, which costs us 50 bucks and dings our credit. Yeah, yep. and uh, we'd write to him and say, "No, no, we'll refund you. You don't have to do a chargeback." And and right. so you know, uh, that's another. They just reason. didn't recognize it, so they didn't know who to exactly. talk to. Exactly. So that's another reason. Yeah. Month to month is probably. Oh, there's all. I this is now that I'm sort of I'm, now that I'm a business jerk. All the stupid stuff you have to deal with, like <laughs> oh, it's I'm hard. sorry, I shouldn't say it that way. I'm sorry. Customer it's, support. It, it's yeah. Customers, I don't mean it that way. I, I, it's weird things. Like someone will say, hey, I don't mean to bother you. Um, I'm going through my father's estate. I'm trying to rectify all these charges he has. And of course, you're going to help those people out. You know, you got to do the right thing. You got to right. refund it, you, you know, whatever. But it's like, it's crazy, like how much of that there is. You know, yeah, it's, right. um, it's constant. Oh, it, incidentally. Month to month would probably make it easier. Yeah. If you subscribe to the year, don't worry. We're not going to, you're going to get the year, but we're just not signing up any new year long yeah. club members. Well, that's in interesting. That. I didn't know you did that. Yeah, uh, yeah, I didn't, it just seemed like, I just didn't want to get to like December. Yeah. No, I, I like it. I have to I, like, people, so I just thought. Right, month the, month. It, it, you have this annual um, cycle and, and yeah. it, it, yep, and you forget, yeah, people forget, yeah. Uh, people also died. Goes, so they Patrick says cargoes, that yeah. uh, we had a number of folks who passed away. Yeah, no, that's what I was just describing. Same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah no, our audience space is around the way out, Leo. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> just, yeah, I feel it every day when I got Club out of bed. Twit, a great christening gift. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, start them young, please. Yeah. We beg of you. Start them young. Let's get to yeah. uh, hardware because there's some interesting stuff going on in the hardware world. Yeah, I think uh, probably last week or whatever recently we talked about Intel is getting a bunch of uh, grants and loans from the mm -hmm. U.S. government through that Chips and Science Act. And uh, now TSMC, which is the world's biggest chip maker, has already, they had already on their own agreed to build two fabs in Arizona, uh, various levels of technology, various timeframes. I think the first of those is going to come online maybe by the end of this year. Um, they, they just got an enormous, uh, or a potentially enormous, we'll see how it actually pans out, but a total of $11 billion in uh, loans and grants from the U.S. government. Potentially, if it, if the full amount is ever given, um, and they're expanding their own investment in the United States, TSMC is up to sixty five billion dollars, which wow. is crazy. They're going to have three fabs, all in Arizona, which is great because Arizona's got plenty of water and no issues there at all. Uh, so that's good. Uh, it's just like the dumbest place to build one of these things, but whatever. Um, but they got great tax incentives for being there, right? 
Oh, yes, so they do. Yes. That. Oh, yeah. Mexico, Putin Arizona Oregon. will declare war on, on Colorado to Just get to this get water, the water if they have yeah. to. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's no doubt about it. Um, yeah, the, I, that whole phoenix is going to be all desert landscaping in about 15 There's seconds a great, I, just, I don't know stacy's book club just read a book about you know uh, a sci-fi book about the near future where that exactly yep. exact thing happens oh yeah listen yeah. it's gonna in the same way that like as as you age you turn into a baby again like phoenix the beginning of phoenix was people who would bathe themselves or their clothes in water Put it on and then go to bed because that was the only way they could stay cold oh, or cool. Or, you know, so cooler. hot, Phoenix. Oh, it's just so brutally hot. The Read the water stone. knife, Paul. Paolo got bunch of galupia. Um, Very curious what you yeah. think. Of I it. mean, I it's lived good. there for several years. I, 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 I it, without even knowing anything about sustainability or anything like that, you can only spend ten minutes there and be like, this place doesn't make any doesn't, sense. No, yeah. in fact, there's, there's a there's no. It's not on a river. There's no. I mean, there is a. River, there's a classic nonfiction dirt. book called uh, Cadillac <clears> Desert. Uh, that yeah. came out about 20 years ago. I interviewed the author at the time, actually 30 years ago now, in which he said, he Is that points about out, Vegas? Or? No, it's about uh, Arizona. It's about basically what it's about is all of these land reclamation projects that we sponsored in the 30s and later to build these great yeah. dams to create livable agricultural areas yep. mm -hmm. in areas that are desert and how this right. is really a very short-term idea. It's the desert will be back. Uh, yeah, interesting. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's a good. It, it oh, was uh, it really using science book. to. Uh, yeah. Well, it was because we well. we decided, really interestingly, you know, to make it our policy, agrarian policy, that we were going to instead of planting arable land, we were going to reclaim <laughs> desert land and make it arable. But you no, just you'd you have know, better luck uh, terraforming Mars, frankly. But it's kind of like terraforming; it really mm -hmm. is. Yeah. yeah, it is a kind of terraforming, except yeah. you know, with the usable atmospheric pressure and yep. resources right. and less radiation and less perchlorates. Like, no, I, I keep working on the Earth. It's a better place. Enough. It takes as long to get there. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, uh, that's what that is. What they're doing? Who cares? But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so we'll see. I obviously you want to get. Uh, it's the trained people the manufacturing in front of this, right? Like, yeah. It's yep. just thousands of engineers. Very, very Yeah, 6,000 direct high wage jobs, yeah. right? So that's, you know, they're going to need, uh, they're going to need water too, by the way. Um, I'm sure I'll yeah. be fine. I'm awesome. worried about the water. I don't know if I made that obvious. Well, you know, I was worried about the water when I lived there. It's not created or destroyed. It's just moved around. It's just expensive to get it from. I think in Arizona, it's actually destroyed. I, I, I think <laughs> that's the problem. I, that's, it's Arizona's, so, you know, someone, you know, the, uh, the dry heat jokes never get old, but I, my response to that was always like, you know what else is a dry heat? A hair dryer. And I don't mm. want to live in one of those either. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, Apparently you do. <laughs> brutal. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Micron, Samsung, and possibly one other company are on the board to probably also receive money from the Chips and Science Act soon. So there'll probably mm -hmm. be more of this stuff coming down the, down the uh, pike. All right. I threw this in the notes real quick. I, I just wrote this before the show, but I wanted to talk about this real quick. I thought this was kind of interesting. I'm temporarily paying for the paid versions of Copilot Pro, um, Chat GPT Plus, right? And uh, Gemini through Google Workspace. And, uh, and I've been, you know, there's a lot you could write about this or talk about because these things are each good at things or better than the others at certain things, but they, it changes almost every week because these things evolve and it's kind of hard to explain. But um, we've talked about some of this, I think, on the show, but there's, there's some really interesting, as we sort of understand AI a little bit better, right? As quickly as it's happening, it's taking a while, mm -hmm. right? You learn things about it. You learn what it's good at, right? And mm -hmm. I think we've talked about this notion that AI, generative AI is particularly good at uh, summarizing content like that, or AI is, I guess, um, you know, here's a lengthy email or here's the transcript from a meeting or here's a really long book or article or whatever, boop, boop, boop. you know, here's five or 10 bullet points. It's, you know, it's good at that, right? Um, we've come to understand that AI is better if you can ground the data, right? Uh, Leo often uses the example of his Lisp uh, LLM where he, you know, it's, custom fed this particular body of knowledge doesn't get polluted by outside things. It, it won't, or hopefully won't uh, hallucinate or make mistakes, that kind of stuff. Um, one of the things I've noticed, cause I, I've been using AI in a very baby like way, right? Hmm. I think a lot of people make this mistake where they're like, I've been using Google search for 20 years or whatever it is. I I'll, I'm going to ask it questions. And it's like, you, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Right? Like 
you can't like if there was an earthquake yesterday in Mexico City and there wasn't, thank God. But um, there was one here last week, by the way. But anyway, um, you could say, hey, what happened yesterday in Mexico City? And open AI would have no idea. Right. <laughs> Pretty much. I mean, it's just not good at that type of thing. But you have to almost understand like what it's good for and what it isn't. And I think as uh, Google especially kind of tailors their search service, it'd be interesting to see how they handle this. Like I, uh, in the same way that like an MPU might fire off on a PC for dirt certain tasks, like uh, in search, they might have to do the same type of thing. Like they'll, they'll look at a question and say, you know what, this one might be better served by our traditional search engine, or this one might be better for this. But, um, but the thing I found using these things, which is really interesting because I, I'll make these, uh, uh, goofy images, right? I use my web articles and, uh, some of the, the prompts I use are very vague and hmm. short and they, that, that halo one, remember with the religious imagery and right. It was like the last, uh, well, supper. Not like you specified religious. Imagery, oh no, no. Right? I, like I want it to vagueness. look like Raphael's painting of whatever. I no, there was nothing like that, mm -hmm. but the thing that's interesting. So that happened, that was a lucky circumstance, right? But the thing I've noticed is that when you're actually trying to create content, it's way better to be way like you, you need to be more specific than you think you need. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is all, I, I don't mean to say it's like a, it is, it's kind of a key learning. I hate to say it like that, like I'm insightful or anything, but I mean, it will change because AI is, you know, again, by next week, this will be old news, but the more specific you can be, the better the, the result will be. And in the beginning, of course, it's hard that we're so used to being terse. We don't want to type. Yeah. You know, we go to, you know, what's the capital of Massachusetts, right? You know, mm -hmm. we just want the answer, you know, but for, the, for creation, you want to be really specific. So I, I just came, I just invented this uh, bogus excuse to try to compare these things. And I remember back when we first started talking about the staff last year, I was like, I use the example of a PowerPoint presentation. I don't like to give PowerPoint presentations. I only do this once a year. I'm not good at it. It'd be really neat if this thing could help me with that. I don't have to hire an expert. I don't have to research it. I don't have to buy a book. I don't have to watch YouTube videos. What if this thing could just create PowerPoint presentations for me? And so I tried it. <laughs> so I, <laughs> I came up with this is, it, you could be way more specific than this. This is a, like I said, a stupid example, but I, I ran this prompt against uh, three, technically four uh, of these AIs to see what they did, right? So I need to create a presentation with a title slide, 10 content slides, and a thank you slide with contact information at the end. Each of the 10 content slides should include a famous quote from a famous individual, plus a representative photo and or background image. The famous people are Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Nelson Mandela, on and on. And then see what it does, right? And I don't, maybe it's, maybe I'm just a simpleton, but I am fascinated by this. And the thing is, I didn't, I didn't go to the time and do need to go to the time to see if these quotes were even made by these individuals. I right. think this is the problem today with this stuff. Right. But this is the, to me was a really good example of how today, if you have copilot for Microsoft 365 or copilot pro, instead of doing this from a chat interface, you do it in the app, right? Cause then it will make it for you. Right. Yeah. Whereas if you go to chat GPT or if you go to Gemini or you go to Copilot, it will describe what these things should look like. But I wanted to actually make the thing, you know? Yeah. No. And, I, um, and one of the things I love with your prompt is you told him to make 10 content slides and then give them nine names. No, did I get, did I screw that up? That's funny. Well, but um, you, say, you said should include. So it's almost like you set it up to now come up oh, with like you yourself. Could add, you could add to it. Yeah. 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 Okay. That's funny. Um, I didn't even notice that. The, the, the co-pilot in PowerPoint was the best because it, you know, it created the part the presentation, which I think looks pretty good. And it's pretty but good. The funny thing slides, is, yeah. Yeah. When you actually look at the slides, it doesn't, there are no quotes. It, it tells you things about the person, which are right. useful and probably mostly true. Um, I would think of those as speaker notes, right. <laughs> you know? Uh, in fact, the interesting thing is the first one I did, which was, uh, Gemini, I think. It just described like slide one, this thing, right? Subtitle, quote, image, and then, you know, it's, it describes the image, doesn't give me the image, but it says, you know, speaker notes. This is for Steve Jobs. Discuss Jobs' reputation as a visionary entrepreneur driven by a relentless pursuit of innovative technology. Explain how the quote highlights the necessity to break new ground rather than merely imitate existing models. Right. Nice. That's, that's, so even that's sounds pretty good that's, really. Yeah. That's pretty good. You know, yep. like I, I, I was kind of impressed by this. Um, 
interestingly, at the end of this, I realized, you know, what, Gemini might be built into the Google Docs apps, you know, in mm -hmm. the same way that Copilot is with Microsoft. Right. And it is. <laughs> so say exactly the same. And uh, so I put, I pasted this into Google Slides and it told me it was it could take, it said something like, this could take as long as 40 seconds, which I thought was curiously specific. <laughs> and then it aired out and it says, for now, we're, <laughs> we're showing limited results for people. Try something else. Uh, <laughs> Try okay. something else. But I need this. Yeah. You know, <laughs> what do you, you know, like. I think anyway. try something else means try something other than Gemini. <laughs> Yeah, right. Well, but the interesting thing is Gemini by itself, Did when it, it wasn't, I, I, think it ha I think it has to do with the images. I think the problem was mm, it said, you want me to give you images of people and, uh, you know, Google mm. that, you know, so it didn't do it. But, well, it, I, but anyway. It, it but interesting that the content filtering was asymmetrical, that only in the Google Docs version right? catch that versus. Yeah, like the, the textual version literally says. Where is it? Uh, You'll get a picture of portrait of Steve Jobs with an early Apple product in the background. Yeah, right. thanks. I, I wanted you to find that image. <laughs> you know, it was the point. I'm lazy. I'm a, I'm a high school student, right? Yeah. I'm trying to get this done. Anyway, I thought this was kind of fascinating, and I, I uh, well, it's such a good exercise. It's a kind of benchmark, right? It's a it's sort of qualitative benchmark. Yeah, of, and it's uh, it's a moving doing? target. The the yeah. problem is. By the time someone's listens to this, they might say, oh, that's kind of interesting. I'm going to go try this myself. Totally and they'll get results. completely different yeah. results, you know, different quality, whatever. But, you well, know, one I like would, um, one would argue different people running this all on the same day are going to get different results. That's too, right. Well, the same person on the same day. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. right. That's true. I would like to think that they would be uh, structured More? similarly, <laughs> hopefully. Right. Uh, the exact content might be different. I, I don't know that we can trust any of the information about the people. No, you have to check it Quotes. out. You'd have to check it all. And this is, of course, is, you know, that's another, by the way, another key learning, I guess, of AI. You're going to have to do some work. You know, this yeah. isn't going to. But it's different kind of work, too. You know, fact right. checking is a lot less painful than trying to come up with facts. Right. The one I should have done is, uh, and I, I thought of this as I wrote it, and I actually added this textually to the article, but I had been working on this other stuff for a couple of days. But mm -hmm. every January, I do a look back at the previous year's PC sales. Mm-hmm. And uh, I use, I, I take the data from IDC and uh, Gartner for the calendar year. So it usually comes out in January, right? And I, I write an article, obviously. PC Market did whatever it did. But I also have this Excel spreadsheet that I created, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, a long time mm -hmm. ago. And it, <laughs> I, I, I find the last year's version because I save it in the January folder for every year. So I go back to this year, I would have gone back to 2023, found it, copied it to the desktop, renamed it. And then I have to update my chart. I have to enter the data. So we have the year and the number of PCs that were sold or whatever it is. And then there's a chart. And every year I have to reteach myself how to update this chart because I literally have no idea. This is the only time I ever use Excel. You should make and actually that would have been, yourself. yeah, that would have been the way to do it. Yeah. Cause it was a year. You can go look at my article. You can look this up. It's on thrive.com for at least mm -hmm. 2015 S through, I don't, I'll make up a year. I don't remember, but through, let's say 2020, maybe that chart had different color lines for every year. And then one year I couldn't figure that out. Now it's still the same color. <laughs> I guess I, I, I gave up. I, that's how bad I am at Excel. Well, I would also argue that Excel keeps moving your cheese too, right? I, like I, see, I, it's a different version each time. Like you're basically relearning it anyway. Like if you leave yourself notes, you're just going to be angry because <laughs> well, you're going to know the differences. I feel like if I used Excel a lot, I would probably be okay. Yeah, because I mean, you'd, be, you'd be rolling with the changes. I think so. But I don't, I look, A, I don't, I'm not a, you don't want, but you are made for copilot. This is a copilot scenario. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. No, but that's why it's such a great example. And even the PowerPoint thing is, is a good example. The idea here is that there are things we're good at and maybe we don't need AI for that. Like I've, it's never occurred to me. I, well, I just did it now, I guess, technically, but I mean, I've never used AI in the writing of anything yeah. that I published, like a write uh, anything I've written or an article or anything like that. But, but I, I'd like to think I'm a good writer, whatever it is, but there are these things I'm not good at. And there are things I like the Excel is great. I only do it mm -hmm. once a year. Um, I, you know, I just don't, I don't even want to learn it. I don't want to know. No. Like someone and, right and, now and, is telling me how, believe me, there's been I people could probably busy writing software. Like, you don't understand. I don't care. Yeah. I just don't care. Like I, you but know, there's, there's software busy being made so that you don't have to care. Right. Yeah. I mean, one would argue, and uh, now I'm going into the technical terms, but like what they're talking about in M365 with RAG, with regen with uh, retrieval augmented generation, Right. Is not only that you could get it to make your graph, but that you could say, see these past 20 graphs, make me one right. like this. That's right. 
or, you know, like even uh, I, I never, this is what I described to is also just step one, right? Yeah. You are going to refine this prompt over time. You're going to have it add detail. Maybe the results will show you that you, Oh, I, I forgot to say, do this too. Um, and then you'll get to the point where it's like presentation based. And I mean, at small yeah. P like not PowerPoint, but you, I, I like the way this looks, but maybe more of a blue and green color scheme or, you know, something like you, you, you I, at some point you're going to be able to, and actually you could probably do it today. I'm just, I, I, did, I only did the first step. I was just uh, kind of curious. I'd be very interested with the co-pilot for PowerPoint saying, can you modernize this deck please? Yes. Right. And see what it right, does. Right. I have a PPT that was yeah. four by three. Yep. Turn it into a PPTX, I assume it's called. Of the 21st And century. make it yeah. 16 by 9, yeah. <laughs> right? High, higher resolution, upscale the graphics mm -hmm. and the text. And yeah, yeah. You, say, you know, I, I, these these history talks I've done, and I'm referencing conferences from like 2000, and I, ha I managed to get the original logo, and it's 320 by 200. Yes. And I sent it to a designer and said, can you make me a 1080p version of this, please? Wow. So, uh, you know that today there are many services free mm -hmm. yeah. that you literally are there too. I did, did these a decade ago, but yeah, yep. I own the yeah. only high resolution version of the, you know, that's beautiful. Tech that, at yeah, 2000 graphics. Yep. Somebody saw nice. it. So that looks so nice. Can I have it? I'm like, no, yeah. I paid for this. This is mine. Yep. I love it. I love it. Yeah. This is, and that's a great example. So you paid whatever you paid. Yep. And today as part of you, you're still paying for it in a sense, but it, mm -hmm. but it's this thing that does so much more. And, and there's no downtime you, if you needed that exact graphic today at 1920 by 1080 or whatever, yeah. you know, yeah, you should software. will do it for you. Unbelievable. Yeah. This is the world. Um, the rest okay. of this AI stuff, I, I would, I intended to blow through this very quickly. I don't think any of this is particularly notable, except that we live in this era now and, and where there's a whole news category and AI it's just, bu 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 yeah. So, yeah. uh, the New York Times, which uh, has a skin in this game, <laughs> reported that uh, OpenAI, Microsoft, Google, and Meta have all stolen content at scale to train their AIs, including uh, a million hours of YouTube video in OpenAI's open AI, open case, mm. uh, where they generated transcriptions for videos before that was a feature of the platform, and then used the transcriptions to train their AI, uh, which is a pretty good use of technology, honestly. Yeah. Um, Microsoft is opening a new AI hub in London. I wonder what that means. Uh, ironically not at their former Camden Yards, uh, store location, which I thought would have, was maybe one of the most beautiful stores on earth for briefly. Hmm. Uh, there's an Apple store in that area that's likewise unbelievably gorgeous, but, uh, that was announced by Mustafa Suleiman. And I'm trying Probably. to get used to saying that guy's name because he is now one of the like top big most AI Microsoft guys, yeah. executives in the world. I wonder uh, how he's going to do it to build keynote. It'll be exciting. Yep. I can't, I can't wait. Well, this is awesome. Um, the first sorry. build keynote without uh, Bob Bijan, right? The leadership's changed. So yep. It's yep. going to be interesting. Uh, yeah. We'll see if uh, Rajesh Shah can summon any excitement. I, I, I get, you know, with different leaders at different levels, you get yep. these ideas that this guy wanted to be on stage. It's important to him. Hmm. And with Rajesh, you get the feeling like he is, they literally have to bring him out in like a Hannibal Lecter cage. Like he doesn't want yeah. any part of it, but they're like, no, you're getting out there. You got to do this. And th that's how it feels. So. Yeah. Well, and I'm wondering um, if they're going to announce new surface hardware. There's no Panos. So who, who? Yep. Uh, I think that that is the rumor that they are. There's supposed to be an event yeah. uh, on day zero, as we call it for the press to see the stuff. And then I assume announce it at the uh, cool. keynote. Yep. Um, this is just a rumor, but you know, Google, I would just talked about this kind of mix of generative AI and traditional internet search, um, mm -hmm. trying to figure this one out. I don't, I, th this, everyone must see this, right? If you go to Google right now mm -hmm. and you just type in a query of whatever kind history of something, something, um, you'll actually get like a, it will generate something at the top of the search results now, which I think is kind of interesting. And sometimes it does it in place as you're looking at it, right? I, I didn't get it to do it here, but. Um, DuckDuckGo does this as well. It's, but they're looking at, um, whether they can or should charge for generative AI. In other hmm. words, you, the, the free bit is the traditional search and the thing you pay for is the generative AI, like the Gemini. It's very YouTube-ish, right? Like it, it used to be YouTube Rev. I think they call it something else yep. now, but that's right. You, you know, could you make a premium product and charge for it and not 
have as much ads and sponsorship? Could it make sure it doesn't suck? I could can't pay for sure it doesn't suck. This is what I'm. This is why I looked at Windows 11 Enterprise. I will pay you. Yeah. Turn off the crap. They turn off the crap. You know. Yep. Because YouTube, um, YouTube with the premium mode on is usable, and YouTube without the premium mode on. Exactly. Not, not, uh, YouTube not might useful. be the best example ever yeah. of why you pay for something, no, no. <laughs> you know, to remove ads. Yeah. Um, yep. I couldn't, I, I, I think I said this recently, like I, YouTube would be the YouTube premium would be the last service I gave up. If you, yeah. if you forced me to have that contest, yeah, I, I would whittle it down and that would be the last one left. Yeah. I would give up Microsoft 365. I would give, you know, <laughs> I would, that would Netflix name anything. That'd be the last one. Cause I could, I could use that. I mean, I could just watch that. Um, Spotify is a. <laughs> I love. I love that we've moved into a text prompt world. But Spotify now lets users create AI-based playlists using text prompts. Like these are like the thing I just described for the uh, Copilot and all those other AIs, where you actually type in a description of the type of thing you're looking for. And I guess I haven't tried it with this one. I suppose being more specific here would be good mm -hmm. too. I really like Van Halen, but I hate this particular album or this singer. So don't you dare give me anything like that. Right. You know that kind of thing. Maybe uh, no, we'll see no how good Hagar, it is. Hagar, is that where you're going? Okay. That isn't where I was going. It was more of a <laughs> <laughs> the guy from Extreme. What was his name? Uh, Gary Sharon. Yeah, okay. skip the Sharon album. The rest Gary, of it's fine. Rest of it's fine. Um, I mean, I, I was thinking more along the lines of make me a playlist that won't make me cry. Right? Like uh, there you go. Yeah. yeah, or make me a playlist that will do nothing but make me cry. Yeah, I want to yeah. wallow in my tears. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's fine. I mean, I. Yeah. When you sign up for a music service, it does mm -hmm. the most basic form of what is not really AI, but it says, you know, what 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 bands do you like? And then it, it. they'll try to make, give you recommendations based right. on those things, right? So there's an algorithm there or whatever that is. And well, it's mostly based uh, on other people's plays. What did they skip when they yeah, were playing? Yeah, the yeah, same there list. you go. Yep, yeah. there you go. Yeah, actually, so if any, so it's kind of fact based or evidence based. Yeah, no, or whatever. We, we've worked on a I've worked on a few recommendations engines over the years for products and things like that right. and hey a good recommendation engine and again i'm coming to this from an e-commerce background it made mm -hmm. its money it was an average sale up 15 percent when the rent when it was working well and when it wasn't working that number went away and i had a sales got very angry you know like good recommendation engines were made money like just clearly yeah, but i mean you know like uh i mean music services today aside from the subscription angle are pretty much playlist based yeah so the better these things can be, you know, you want that. You want that moment of happy surprise. You're like, nice. I like this song a lot. That was yeah, a good choice. You know, you want it, you want never it to heard feel before like, and it was amazing. Yeah, right. Exactly. There's nothing better, especially at my age. You know, you find like new music now is almost next to impossible. Yeah. But then you find new music that's actually good. You're like, nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like that's very much appreciated, right? Yeah. It's, I, I so, know, yeah, like, do that. You're, you're like, I, I want this kind of music. I want it to be whatever. Like, yeah, I, I. I like the idea. I don't yeah. like Spotify, but um, uh, Brave, uh, which has its, um, they call it an AI assistant. This is the in-browser thing. Uh, probably last November brought it to desktop across all platforms. They brought it to iOS. No, no, I'm sorry. Android back in February, I think. And then recently they brought it to iOS, meaning uh, iPhone and iPad. And uh, no one knows about this, but they also have a service called Brave Talk, which is a way to, by the way, have completely free video calls through the browser at HD quality with up to four people and never pay a cent and have no limits. Um, or you can pay them seven ninety nine, I think it is a month to have a premium version with uh, hundreds of people and transcriptions and it does all these other features. Um, they've added Leo to this. So if you pay for brave talk hmm. premium, which probably no one does, it will give you additional features like summarizing the transcription and, you know, making the bullet points and uh, a bunch of other stuff like that. So I, this is, you know, it's, this is a, I'm not saying this is something people should do per se, but it, it's interesting to me. This is interesting. Maybe as an example of how AI is going to permeate little, every little nook and cranny, if mm -hmm. you will, of our industry. Yeah. To the point um, where it's just software. Like, you know, you won't yeah. know. Cause it's yeah, just exactly. There. Yep. It's like red eye removal. It used to be like a premium feature of yeah. Photoshop and it, you couldn't find a photo app that doesn't offer that. Um, and then, uh, Google has something that is basically their version of, uh, what do you call it? GitHub Copilot, which is used to be called StudioBot, And now because everything has to be called Gemini over there, uh, they've got, uh, 
copilotitis. Mm. <laughs> um, they're calling this thing Gemini and Android. It's still in preview. It's in the current beta version of Android Studio, um, which will become the stable version sometime this summer. So it's almost out of preview. But um, so what did they actually call it? It's no longer Studio Bot. It's Gemini Bot or Gemini in Android. Andro I'm sorry, I misnamed it here. It's, it's Gemini in Android Studio is the oh, name. Great. So they've really picked up the Microsoft naming strategy. Yep. Exactly. So they add foundation to the end of that. Would that be better? R2. Yeah. Um, R2 Community Edition <laughs> Preview 7. Yeah. I, I you know what, whatever. <laughs> it is so, so strange how this is going around, right? Like, yep. I mean, you guys are in monopolistic trouble now, and and you can't name your products anymore. Like, yep. who are you? Dominant tech giant that has trouble naming their products. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> yep. I and you think you. you're not the next Microsoft? Okay. You sure? Um, you sure? Are you really sure? Yep. There's something there. Um, and then na, 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 that's it for AI actually. So in the Xbox space, a couple of things, um, mm -hmm. I, I, I meant to do this as a joke and I just forgot. Um, I was going to do a, a story every week where it's like yet another week of no news of Activision Blizzard games yeah, coming to game. Gonna, Pass, that's but, the only question is, are all the Activision yeah, game, yeah, games we got out yet? Yeah, no, it's not. Okay, there's, right. there's still only one. Um, so that's neat. It's just um, Diablo four. It's just Diablo four. That's right. Okay. I'm, uh, I'm, good, I got to tell you, good. I'm really excited for the Fallout movie. I really am. Yeah. I hope it's, it I a, hope it's, it's a movie or TV series. I thought or it was TV a, series. I don't know. TV, Does it mean yeah. anything anymore for the, for the production of the Fallout, the Fallout I, thing? I mean, I, I really enjoyed the TV games. series now, honestly, right? Like, um, yeah, I, I just, yeah. I feel like these stories deserve that kind of space. You take more time. Yeah. Like the, the way that last, I mean, last of us couldn't be done in two hours. It needed. Yeah. What, give, the it the, the, give it the time plus. it deserves. I love it. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's unfortunately a, a lot of the stories are really like six hours, but they drag it out to 10. So you get a lot of superfluous yeah, nonsense, yeah. but it's okay. I'd rather have that than tough. You know, you could never do the Lord of the Rings as a two hour movie, right? But so they're doing three movies. Yeah. But you what about the, the uh, 20, the 20 episode arc? We've seen a couple of commercials now, and even the boss is looking at me like, is this going to be any, is this, what is this? And like, this is a video game that I adored years ago, and uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, not yeah. going to be a good thing. And she's like, and well, if it's it can't be good. And I'm like, no, but there are all these different versions of Fallout that take place in different oh, yeah. times and places. I mean, there's, there's a franchise well, and possibility. The, and, here. you know, that 50s retro vibe thing is powerful, you know? Yep. It really You is. know what the problem with this thing is, though? Mm-hmm. It's on Amazon Prime. That's a shame. Which means there are going to be commercials unless you give they them a little additional got me. Three bucks a vig. month. They got me. There you go. I have, I'm doing me. everything I can not to do this. I, I am actively resisting Amazon content. And I just, what did I just see? Oh, I forget. Because I, I, I literally, like I said, I'm actively avoiding it. But th there was some, I don't know, some set of movies that are on Amazon. I'm like, damn it. I want to, like, you know, it's like, I don't want to pay for this, but. Anyway, they'll get me eventually. They you, know always do in the end. you know you're gonna. You're gonna. You're well, gonna. in lieu of any Game Pass titles this month, uh, this week rather, um, we have uh, an April update or a set of April updates really for Xbox across console and the Xbox app on the PC. They went really big on the PC app for some reason. All they've done is add the game hubs that have been in the console for, I think, several months now to the app, um, which, I don't know. I mean, I just don't care anymore about this thing. <laughs> it just doesn't seem like a big deal to me, but, um, you know, there's, uh, they added discord integration last year if they killed mixer, you know, you thought I wasn't going to remember that name. No way. Um, and that's been updated where you can hear soundboard audio now from other people in the channel or call, and you can turn that off if you don't like that. Um, remember they also added last year, uh, auto or the option for updating screenshots and videos. Uh, captures to OneDrive, which I duh, you know, it should have been there from the beginning. Um, people are apparently using that so much they're now adding notifications to let you know that your cross storage is getting low because you have too many stupid screenshots and video captures, which I could totally see. I, I mean, isn't I that, isn't that the point? Create devices I, so that you use OneDrive. More. Yes, click here to pay for another gigabyte, uh, terabyte, or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so that kind of stuff. Not, not a big. This is not a big month uh, as far as the uh, the monthly system update goes, but it's that's happening. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Probably two weeks ago we talked about that big Microsoft AI reorg. Yep. And then a week ago we talked about the guy who was like, "Nope, I'm out." Yeah. <laughs> you know. 
Um, this past week, there has been a, this is a report from Windows Central. This is not something Microsoft announced, but um, there has been a reorg apparently in the Xbox uh, group. And one of the key players uh, from Project X Cloud, which is Xbox God Gaming, uh, is left because of the reorg, Interesting. <laughs> so, uh, which we don't know any details of because Microsoft has not come out publicly and but said you what's know, going on there. Bit by bit, I'm getting the feel that this idea that is, they're building a consumer group. Yep. Yep. You know, with AI at its top. And it seems to there, be true. yeah, and it might be leading to a what we might call a non traditional selection of people that there are these other guys who've been around for all like, wait, excuse me, <laughs> like yeah. what's going on here? I, sh I shouldn't I be part of this? Um, we've all well, been we, passed over for a promotion at one point. Well, and I wonder I mean, if that's the sort of thing. It's like, no, we want you to learn from these folks. It's like, I don't, I don't want to learn. And they're out. I don't want to learn. I'm, what, I'm, what do you mean learn? I'm 57 yeah. years old. Yeah. I, I found the way I want learn. to do stuff and I'm not going to do it another way. It's like, yep. okay. Um, find another team. Yeah. So that, I, I feel like this departure, like that guy from, uh, from the AI group. Buck, 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 buck. Yeah, but what was he? He was in, um, I don't know if he was in Bing, wherever, wherever he was. Uh, and I, I feel I feel like these are related in that sense. Like they're just people who are like, yeah, I don't like this. This is this is not working for me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're going to step on some toes. Yeah. If you're, and again, you still get the sense that uh, Satchi doesn't know what he wants to do in consumer. He just knows what was happening wasn't working. And so yeah. he is bringing in other folks and it's a shakeup. But he, I mean, yeah. again, you, you mean, if Satya cracks consumer for Microsoft, you were talking about trying to make your mark, an, an impossible thing to make a mark on. I don't on see this company. Has anyone ever hit three grand slams in a single game? Because no. I, I don't understand how that could work, but no. Well, you could make a really good case for Microsoft explicitly just ignoring consumer pretty much right except for actually you know, xbox whatever Which largely they have right they, they, well that's why that's why i said xbox explicit i mean really I, been technically they sort of have yeah right right and, but i reason. like that they i've always liked the consumer offerings that sort of emulate what they have for businesses mm -hmm. like this notion of OneDrive and sync and the uh, microsoft 365 suite and um I, I you know i i think i don't i like it personally i mean i like using that stuff um but yeah, as far as like a pure play consumer, I mean, what, what are we talking about here? Like in Carta, Mungo mm -hmm. Park? When was the last time? <laughs> what, you know what I mean? Like, what? How far back do we have to go? Oh, like, I don't even. Carta. Well, they remember made that there was a there was a Microsoft phone. It was an actual like a you plugged it into the wall. What? Like what? a phone with like a, a number what? telephone. Remember? What? Yeah, what? like a telephone. What plug? Like what? What would go? RJ, like the phone RJ plug. Fifteen. Yeah. Uh, RJ, I think it might have had the. I think it might have been called Outlook something. Yeah, it was a yeah. This is, they've they they've tried. They used to do a lot of uh, you know when Ab Apple was really big on the digital media stuff on the Mac with making movies and DVDs uh, eventually and the, whatever and they, the they tried all that stuff. Words and the mice and it's like they've had a lot of hits over the years, but they've never it's never really resonated. I mean, no one's going to Oldsmobile, which doesn't exist anymore, for the hot new sports car. I mean, mm. I just don't. I don't know. This doesn't seem like the right no, mix. But I, I know folks who love that that the split ergonomic keyboard so much that they they bought a I, dozen of them and stashed oh, them away. You, um, I am one of those oh, people. There you go. I, 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 this is no longer the case. I brought my last one, my last extra see, one to Mexico. But out. I used to have yeah. three of them up in the closet. Yeah, yeah. as they break. Yeah. So, and uh, sometime this year they're coming back. Right. Thanks. I, uh, so you've survived the drought. Well, that's not. I don't want. You know, don't I, I don't have it. any actual wood in here, but uh, let me knock on something that looks like wood. It's probably particle board. Um, yeah, so far I've been okay, but yeah, but but that I'm getting down. You know, like it's, you're getting down. You know, these, this is it. Know, these are not that way. Oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so this is another rumor slash report from a third party, also uh, Windows Central, but. Makes sense. I mean, Phil Spencer has been talking about this uh, very explicitly, and this has always been a big part. Well, not always, but has now for a long time been a big part of the Xbox brand, which is this theme of um, game preservation, right? The backward compatibility stuff, the ability to now stream this stuff uh, over the cloud and not have to worry about the underlying hardware is all part of an effort to make sure that your library means something. You know, that when a new console, a new generation of uh, software, whatever comes out, you you don't have to say goodbye to that stuff, you know. Um, that's always worked better on the PC, and of course, Xbox is kind of cross-platform now. But um, supposedly now they have a 
a team that will kind of formalize and expand on that work that began with backwards compat um, and make sure that the libraries that people have of games, you know, move forward with people as, you know, as things change. I think that's cool. So yeah, I th that's cool. Think. Can't complain about that. No, I just bought and, my uh, uh, Atari mini 400. I showed it on ask the tech guys. It's about this yeah, big. Nice. It's yeah, 25 little, great yeah, games the on it. The computer. Yeah. yeah so yep. cool. Yeah, very happy with it. But nice. you know what? You play those games for about five minutes and you realize, yeah, You're like, oh, yeah we've come a long it. way, baby. <laughs> this actually yep. is a little, this actually has. That was the, um, that was the dark horse uh, technical winner of that generation. Like the Commodore 64 was the biggest computer in the world. But the the guy, uh, what's his name? Um, Nolan Bushnell. Mm -hmm. Well, no, I was thinking of the guy who made the chipset. Uh, the guy who went on to do the Amiga chipset. Oh, the 6502 guy. The chipset on the... Uh, no, no, not sorry. <laughs> um, the, uh, his name is Jay something. Oh, um, yeah. Okay. I know who you mean. I uh, God, it's awful. I can't think of that. Anyway, the, the Atari 800 and 400... Well, Paul, by the way. Yeah, I, I, I stopped. I, I, well, you, you don't have to stop learning. His stuff falls <laughs> out the back. J Minor? J Minor? That sounds Maybe? right. Um, That's he, good. The, those 8-bit Atari computers were essentially multi-processor yeah, computers. Yeah, got it. And um, they, uh, you know, he took that architecture and built on it to make the Amiga later, right? So yeah. ironically became a commoner product. But technically, in many ways, uh, not in all ways, the sprites of the 64 were better, but in many ways, the music, sound, a lot of the graphic stuff um, was, you know, superior on the Atari. I sense. couldn't afford an Apple I didn't too, appreciate so it at the time. I got an Atari uh, as my first Nobody got, computer. Geez. And I loved it. And yeah, I was very aware of the Antic chip and the CTI chip and all the stuff yeah, that Miner designed. That, right. that was very unusual. Yep. It had, um, yep. it was made for games, so it had uh, uh, sprites in hardware and stuff like that. It was really quite cool. It's quite a neat yeah. piece of hardware. Yep. Yep. Um, all right. Genius. Genius. It comes in many flavors. <laughs> Let's take a, a little time out. Uh, you're watching Windows Weekly. Paul Therott, Richard Campbell. More to come in just a bit. The back of the book. In fact, let's kick off the back of the book with Paul's tip of the week. Yeah, so every spring Microsoft store has a sale. Hardware and software and games. Um, if you're looking to buy a last-gen Surface device, this is not a bad time to look. You can save a lot of money on that stuff. Surface Laptop 5, Surface Pro 9, there are bundles, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There's no real good sales on Xbox hardware, but honestly, the Xbox Series S has been priced in the right place for a long, long time. Uh, Microsoft does have a refurbished store. A lot of people don't know. That's, you can see that if you go to the, the store website, they offer Surface PCs and Xbox consoles refurbished on sale. I'm, I don't know what the quality is there. But I, other than that, I would say the big things to look at are Xbox wireless controllers, uh, 20 bucks off. The, they're usually 65 bucks. And then the special editions also. A lot of those are on sale, including the wireless controller, uh, Elite Wireless Controller 2 and the Elite Wireless Controller 2 Core, which is the less expensive version. And then... Xbox console and PC games are all, there's some huge sales. Definitely, if you are looking to get games on sale, uh, go through some of these lists. Older games, newer games, whatever, like Destiny 2 Collections, 15 bucks, is $45 off. Uh, Halo, the Master Chief Collection is often on sale, but $10 if you don't have that. And if you don't have that, seriously, come on. Uh, lots of stuff in there. So just go, there's literally almost 1,000 Xbox games and about 450 PC games on sale. So. A lot of stuff, yeah. And I love this aspirational trade in your Mac. You know, <laughs> trade in, wait, wait, does trade, it say that? Yeah, trade in your Mac. It says trade in your Mac. Yeah, get, get oh, rid that's of that old screenshot. thing and get a nice Surface Pro. Oh, that Dude, is, that's Don't you amazing. want a real computer? Don't you want a real? What's a computer? If you're going to trade in your Mac, trade it in at Apple. Those guys give really <laughs> <Yeah>. good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they really do. Don't do it with my. They really, not Microsoft. Yeah, don't give it to it. Microsoft. Yeah, they're yeah, going to trade it in for another Mac. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Trade in your Mac. Um, <laughs> That's funny. So, um, I have two app picks. I, I I I can't claim that I use either one of these. I might be using one of them pretty extensively if it works out the way I want it to. So, um, the interesting thing about both these, though, is that they're they're both acquisitions by companies that I really like and respect and uh, 
will probably be using more of their stuff <laughs> in the near future. Um, the first one is Proton bought a company called, that, or the company, that, the very small company, that makes something called Standard Notes. Um, I spend approximately 72% of my waking hours investigating MarkPad note taking apps and editors, and I have never heard of this thing. <laughs> and it looks a lot like Notion. The problem is Isn't the free everything? version is only plain text. You can't even do like formatting, like bold and italics. Like if you want to have rich text or markdown support, you actually have to pay for it. And it's a subscription. I'm kind of hoping that they change that. But if you're looking for kind of a basic notion type solution, that's free and not, not as good as the notion that is for also free. I, I guess it's a thing, but because it's proton, it's potentially interesting because proton of course makes a bunch of awesome privacy, um, uh, protecting apps, you know, mail calendar, the password manager, et cetera. So I like that company a lot. We'll see. And then Beeper was acquired by Automatic with two T's at the end. Automatic is the company behind WordPress and Akismet. And, um, or to my mind, they're the company behind Pocket Cast, which is the podcast app I use. And uh, Simple Note, which is actually a pretty good. They also Simple own Note Texts, account. which is a all-in-one pigeon-like yeah. Uh, message that's right platform so, so they're going to combine text and beeper yeah yeah they're going to combine them that's exactly right and uh this is a thing that right now works with a, a, about a dozen different messaging services including sms and rcs which is good this is the app that by the way we think we all know uh went after iMessage trying to bring it to android apple thwarted them several times and is now being investigated for antitrust violations for that oh, yeah. <laughs> so Oops. uh interesting yeah. um so uh, they pointed that out and said, hey, you know, we might be adding iMessage to the list. We're going to try, you know. Um, but once Apple does support RCS later this year on the iPhone, um, the notion of having a messaging app that works with, you know, WhatsApp, Slack, um, whatever else you might have, I mean, um, is very appealing. And uh, just to rub salt in a wound that I think half of us feel, uh, this was the original vision for Windows Phone, right? That they would have these hubs that would bring in all the services yeah. to a single place. Now, this and idea that I have one contact, a contact and it, yep. all the different things go to. And you could say message and it would say, which service do you want to use? You yeah. know, that kind of thing. Love it. Beautiful. Day. Um, when that thing first shipped in October 2011, I think it was, uh, messaging had bought into this. So we had Skype, Facebook Messenger, SMS, and MMS all in one app. Mm -hmm. And it was wonderful. And then 15 sure. seconds passed and Facebook was like, wait, what are we doing? And they, they walked away from it. So that ended yeah. that dream. But yeah, um, they're trying, Beeper's trying and now Automatic's trying and Automatic's a good company. Um, yeah. Tough problem. So I was a trillion yeah. user back in the day. Yeah, trillion. Nice. I remember yeah, that. yeah, yeah. There you go. Trillion. Trillion, trillion and example. Pigeon yep. both did the same thing. Yeah. 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 So the thing, but the thing about Beeper and mm, yeah, and the other app I mentioned, they're both cross-platform mobile and desktop. They're literally on everything. So you yeah. can get a native app. If I'm not mistaken, Beeper has a native app, app not just on Windows and Mac, but on um, it's it's available for Chrome OS. It's available for Linux. It's available on, obviously, Android and iOS and the iPad. And it's, uh, it's I think it's this, it's not just cross-service, which is awesome, but cross-platform, which makes the difference, right? You'll have this wherever you are, which is, you know, ideal, potentially. I'm going to, I'm, I'm look, I've installed it everywhere. I'm going to try to make it work. Yeah. Awesome. No, I, I love that because it, I mean, the reality now is that every machine has half a dozen different messaging apps open for these various oh God, every really machine. islands like, oh, of I, community. Yeah, I have a know? folder called yeah. chat yeah. yeah, that has one, nine, 10, 12 apps in it. Yeah. What I have taken to making like, notes for, uh, about people. It's like, which of these am I likely to reach you on? That's right. Yeah. yeah, Richard and I will talk on WhatsApp. Raphael yeah. and I talk on Skype for some reason. I guess we hate ourselves. <laughs> um, you know, Brad and I use Google, the Google chat thing because we're on the Google workspace, whatever Same nonsense thing. that is. Let's see. Yeah. It's, Messages, it's, it's, it's Slack, ridiculous. Discord, yeah. chat, meet. I don't know why I still have those. Zoom, mm, FaceTime, yeah. Telegram, Signal, Threema, Wire, <laughs> Ring Central. Yep. I mean, it, yeah, it goes on. Old yeah, so I mean, a lot of the one that France says you have with to this use. Service, WhatsApp. like. Um, Signal does, yeah, uh, yeah. WhatsApp does, uh, Messenger, Messenger does, does yep. chat. I try uh, text. Google chat, Slack does, I, It's Zoom ugly does. and I don't like it, but yep. Uh, yep. with some work, the premise is good. I like, I. this is uh, the, the the chat version of write once, run everywhere. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right? It's the Java right. yeah, of chat. It's the Java oh, of Messenger. I'm the, sorry I said that. <laughs> it's the Java of Jira. Wait, what? No, what, huh? 
Right uh, one, right once, reply everywhere. <laughs> my wife thinks that everything I talk about sounds like nonsense because yeah, it, it does. It all and, is gobbledygook. But even even to me, it's starting to sound like <laughs> yeah. nonsense. Yeah. Well, what's not <laughs> nonsense? This week's run mm -hmm. as radio. Richard Campbell has. Oh yes, a great show. Um, this is uh, the show I did with Sarah Young, and I'm afraid it's almost gotten a little long in the tooth. I had an opportunity to grab a lot of in-person interviews when I was at uh, NDC in Sydney, which was in February. So this is now two months old, and it's about securing AI, which is such a moving target that as I was looking at the notes, I'm like, oh, wait, but where's the content studio, uh, content safety studio? Because <laughs> it didn't exist in February. Right, right. But it does it does now. So uh, Sarah is this firecracker security person. She's just a ton of fun to talk to. She's 100 miles an hour, uh, knows backwards and forwards. And so and, and I'm, I'm dealing with sysadmins who've got this challenge where it's like this thing's coming to my company. Like, what do I need to know? And so we just ran down, start with the fundamentals. How are you authenticating? What's the authorizations? What is the gradation of security? Like what services can you access to? And then we get into more of the specifics around LLM, some of the, the frightening parts. And again, you know, that great line, you must have your data estate in order. Such an easy thing to say for something that's impossible to do, like being perfectly secure. And that led to other Microsoft -y products like, uh, like Purview which is really about looking at your data estate. Where is information? Okay. Is it tagged appropriately? Not a good name, Purview. Yeah. Well, because you <laughs> are looking, you have a view over your pervs. No. Well, it's a, it's, 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 it's a perv view. What is, what are uh, we doing? Yeah. What are they, what are they going for? Maybe they but, work. Uh, you know, a part, an important part of this is that when modern tagging is security tagging is used in the M365 space anyway, Anything that you use that data in, like if you create a PowerPoint deck, it will automatically have the same security clearance on it. Uh, and so that uh, security propagates outward from that and it helps protect information. And that's especially relevant with LLM. So we dug into all of this. But I will add to the show notes now because I, I was doing the review that there is now in Azure AI Studio a thing called Content Safety Studio. And Content Safety Studio specifically gets down into categories of content that are con that may be appropriate in different contexts. You know, often we don't we don't want to see you know, you know the, what's inappropriate in a business setting is not necessarily inappropriate in a home setting or different kinds of professional work. You know, uh, doctors deal with cadavers on a regular basis. That's not something you want showing up at home. Uh, and so the the idea that you have to gradiate content access is a complex problem for a lot of organizations, but there is tooling appearing for it. And Sarah talked around this a fair bit at, at the time, but clearly I think she knew these products were coming. She just wasn't allowed to talk about them yet. Yeah. And so yeah. uh, we got into them. We did uh, certainly get into what they call the system, me system message framework, which has specific security recommendations for LLMs. So. Um, well worth your listen, like a just a dense set of conversation, but yes, it's been a couple of months. The, the fences are moving. And so there's been a couple of new products that have made this easier than they were back in February when we we're talking. Nice. Now we have some uh, lovely brown liquor. I still have a half a bottle of that stuff you brought last week. That was so good. Oh, the um, the the Conakilty. Conakilty. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah I'm the looking Conakilty at right from now. Ireland. Yeah. And, and of course, you know, I don't know how we we've done like over a hundred of these now, and it's not like I'm running out of whiskey, but I do. I now have to keep notes <laughs> to keep track of which ones have I talked about, which ones have I. Database. <laughs> Hold on. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm take a break. I'm doing I'm, it in the loop. <laughs> well, no, I'm going to write the database in Java, and we'll be back. Uh, okay, we'll be back yeah. in, a, in a couple of years. Uh, this is uh, Windows Weekly. Paul Thorat and Richard Campbell. You've been waiting for so, it. You've been wanting it all day. Yeah. Let's get a brown liquor in here, Richard. I uh, it was time to go back to Scotland and to go to a, a traditional. So uh, the Dalwini 15, it was one of those ones when I uh, I picked it up off the shelf because I do like it and thought, I must have already talked about this. And I thumbed through my notes and went, I've never talked about Dalwini 15. Oh, my goodness. So I, I grabbed a bottle because uh, I'm home. I get to do that. Um this, uh, the, the word Dalwini, a Gaelic word that means the meeting place, that the village of Dalwini is in an intersection point uh, geographically. 
uh, on the southwestern part of the Highlands. It's nominally actually still in the space side, although they generally refer to themselves as a Highland whiskey. Um, the distillery was built not that long ago. It was only in 1897. Remember, we are talking about part of the world where, A, there's been humans for thousands and thousands of years. Uh, that that particular area was better known for smuggling things than making whiskey. The original distillery was built uh, in 1897 by John Grant. That is the same Grant on Spey, the folks who built many other distilleries. And it was named the Strath Spey uh, because that's the name of the waterway nearby. Uh, it la that name lasted a year because they ran out of money pretty quickly within a year. Uh, they picked the location because Dalwini at that time had the railway already in it. This is 1897, so that's impressive, as well as uh, various roads. But by 1898, uh, A.P. Blythe has bought it and renames it after the town Dalwini. And so it has the normal whiskey experience of the uh, early uh, 20th century, including dealing with the challenges of World War I, uh, with Prohibition, they had a big fire in in 1934 that shuts it down for years. And then uh, post-World War II, they generally start to modernize. You see, you see more news from them in the 50s and 60s when they switch over to steam heat. They did their own maltings until the mid-60s. Then they, like everyone else, uh, had to switch to third-party maltings. And then British Rail shut down their siding, but by then the highway had come through. And they were acquired by... Um, United Distillers in 1987. And United Distillers, of course, became Diageo. And you'll notice that the website that I provided for this is malts.com, which is owned by Diageo and has all many of Diageo's brands in there, including Johnny Walker and, and so forth. But back in 89, uh, United Distillers, in a promotional move towards Scottish whiskey, did this promotion called the six classic malts of Scotland. And so they picked like great representations of each of the regions. Now um, there are seven regions uh, for that are recognized for whiskey. And that is Lowland, Highland, Speyside, Sky, Isley, and then uh, Campbellton. They don't have, didn't have a distillery in Campbellton. So they just left it up. <laughs> And in fact, they actually used Highlands twice because they listed both the Oban, which is the West Highlands, and they called Dalwini a Highland as well, it, although it's nominally a space side, but they included Cragamore, also a spay. Uh, and we've only done, well, I've done the, talked about Oban before. It's the only one of the original, of the six classics that I've talked about, but I will do them all inevitably, but we can't just keep hammering away on Scottish whiskey all of the time. So by 1997, of course, Diageo is formed out of that big merger with all the different companies, including United uh, Distillers. So that's Dalwini being a part of it. The distillery itself is one of, it's not a huge, it's a mid-sized distillery. They they push through a, a lot of whiskey, millions of, of gallons a year. They have uh, wood washbacks. They do long, they, what I, I love these guys. They do 60 hour fermentations. Uh, during the week, but on the weekend, it's 110 hours, so nobody <laughs> needs to come in. Uh, <laughs> That's the way to do it. <laughs> they still run on only two stills. They have two large stills, and they use wooden worm tub condensers coming out of them, which is old school. They actually took them out in the in the 80s and brought them back in the aughts. So uh, they've stuck to the original uh, techniques. Uh, Dalwini is also a blending whiskey. So uh, Diageo owns Buchanan's and Black and White. These are two original blends. Before single malts were a thing, you could buy Buchanan's and Black and White. Black and White's been made since the distillery opened, it, or even before, in, in 1879. And you'll, you, you won't see this bottle uh, in Scotland at all. It's only sold abroad. But it has both a Scottish and a West Highland Terrier, the Black and white sky terriers on the label. And you can actually get a bottle of that from BevMo in the 1.75 liter format. That's 60 ounces for those who are counting for 45 bucks. Uh, however, when you come to a product actually named for Dalwini, this is it. The, da the Dalwini 15 is the only product they sell. They have a couple of special editions, distillers editions, but otherwise this is what you're getting. Like the Oban, where you can only really get Oban 14, although there's Little Bay and a couple of others. Really, it's the one. And I already have the bottle and it's afternoon, so that's close enough for me, so I get to have a taste. <laughs> uh, now, it's 
nominally a space side, so you'd think it would be sherry cast, but no, nope, they tend to stay strictly with the bourbon cast. So it's pretty pretty light colored for a 15 year old. They're not doing any color uh, in it. They also add a tiny bit of peat to it in their in their maltings. And of course, they order them that way they, these days. So there's just a touch of smoke. But otherwise, it's quite a fruity, sort of fun, bright, uh, non burny kind of product. 15 is a nice age. You know, you take a lot of the edge off of that. And they don't mess around with the barrelings. It's pretty straightforward. This is 43% ABV, a touch low typically for a, a whiskey in this category, but that's fine. Um, about 95 US dollars for a bottle of this. Worth every penny. This is a proper single malt spay, which typically come in the $100 range for this age. And uh, it should be on your shelf. This is a keeper. It's very drinkable. And this is one of the whiskeys that people uh, who are uncomfortable with whiskey, I'll often feed them. It's like, I don't uh, think I like whiskey. It's like, try this. Nice. It's not quite as cloying as, say, a Dalmore 12. Um, it doesn't get the punch of an Abelur Abenunf, but it's got character to it. It tastes like something. And it's got a little heat in the, on the finish but not too noisy on the mouth. So, so it, it's a real nice balance, and I'm always glad to have it around. This uh, bottle will be going into my decanter on the shelf oh, as nice. my evening sip um, <laughs> for the, as long as that might last. I suddenly feel the need to visit you at home. Um, <laughs> it can make a trip up the coast. You should. They, is that we, weird? I... <laughs> not a bit. No, the boat, the boat house is getting a new deck, man. You should come up. Oh, nice. Yeah. Anyway. You know, uh, a lovely dram and uh, absolutely, you know, I've, I, after going down the weirds and the bads and all those sorts of things, I just thought it was time for a classic. And uh, and literally, definitionally, this is a classic. Dalwini, mm -hmm. the 15-year-old single malt mm -hmm. scotch. Ish. Malts com has it. That is that is Diageo's site. Yeah. Um, yeah. and, uh, you know, the, but you're better off going to your local BevMo or your total wine sure. or something like that. I've seen you it can yeah. find this. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen it. There. Yeah. But, it, and, and it's, and there lies the problem, which is that there's so many whiskeys you're staring at going, what am I looking at here? Yeah, so if no there's kidding. any, if there's anything I can do for you, it's like, listen, it's as special as it seems. Some of them are not. This one is. Well, I know my There's mom's going to ask me to go in and. Get the uh, the handle, uh, Hiram Walker. So maybe I'll bring her back a Dalwini just to surprise her. We'll get her the just black to... and white because it's got it's got Dalwini in it. Okay, all right, yeah. There you go. And it's a and it's a that's a sixty. Right? It's the big one, you know, with the with the big handle on it. They call it handles <laughs> for a reason. It's got a handle on it. You, you like, got to curl those things, man. Like they're yeah, heavy. It's the luggage it's of whiskey bottles. <laughs> it's, it's good. Yeah. yeah. Mr. Richard Campbell is at runasradio.com. That's where .NET Rocks lives as well. Joins us every week for the show, as does Paul Thorot from Thorot.com, T-H-U-R-R-O, double good. And his books are at leanpub.com, including the Windows Everywhere book and the Field Guide to Windows 11, a couple of really must-haves. If you've got Windows, you need those books. Uh, we do Windows Weekly on a Wednesday, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, 1800 UTC. You can watch us live on YouTube, as with all of our live shows, uh, youtube.com slash twit. Uh, there's also a dedicated YouTube channel for the Windows Weekly videos. Great way to share a clip if there's something you want to share. Maybe a whiskey lover in your life you want to turn on to Dal Winnie. You can also subscribe in your favorite podcast client. We like Pocket Cast, just like Paul. Me too, yeah. Yeah, but there are a lot of, uh, a lot of good ones, and all of them have Windows Weekly. Once you subscribe, you should get it automatically. The minute it's available. We thank our club members for making this possible, twit.tv slash club twit. We thank all of you for being here. Now, you winners and dozers, I think it's time to say goodbye to all our family. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, That's Richard. Funny. I was just, that song went through my head just as you said that. <laughs> we'll see now you next week. Now it's time to say goodbye to all, all the of family. T-H-U-R-R-O-T. <laughs> all right. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next week. And with his weekly.